Thank you so much. So um, the first item of today's discussion is actually the work program, which is supposed to be the last item of the yesterday, but then we had such a full-fledged discussion of other items than yesterday. So this item work program is postponed to uh, to this morning. So I would like to invite uh, the uh, the Gustavo and the team to present the work program for for your consideration. Gustavo, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Naoko, and uh, good morning to everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the the Jeff work program for the December 2019 uh, session. This is the third uh, work program on the Jeff Seven cycle, and this work program brings some significant advancements and milestones for the funding cycle we are in, including uh, solidifying sectoral and focal area integration along with tackling drivers of environmental degradation as standard features of Jeff resource programming. We are at 18 months of the 48 months uh, replenishment cycle, which ends in uh, June of 2022, and the proposed projects and programs, uh, including the ones that uh, are included in this work program, will bring the utilization of star resources close to 50%. So we are really accelerating programming as fast uh, as we can. Uh, also significant uh, will be that uh, there are a lot of resources directed to vulnerable countries in Africa and Asia, and also across LDCs and SIDS. Uh, we also enhancing the impact program uh, cohort by introducing uh, other major JEF7 initiatives, uh, including the Sustainable Cities uh, Impact Program. And uh, also, this is the first time that we introduce uh, to your uh, consideration uh, projects that will draw from the non-grant instruments uh, window for blended finance. And we also have other strategic projects that are at the core of, uh, of JEF7 uh, programming, uh, programming resources. Um, Bringing stakeholders together, and we discussed yesterday uh, a lot on this uh, through staff and other sessions, and bring, building new alliances can greatly expand the reach of the Jeff, and they are included in this work program in many ways, uh, through uh, particularly an ambitious project that are building powerful alliances with private philanthropies and other donors uh, to bring accelerated action to the oceans. And a pioneer project also included in this work program, uh, the Inclusive Conservation Initiative, aims to empower indigenous people's organizations to become more effective stewards of their lands. And this was also shown by Rosina yesterday in terms of this expanse of land that's under tenure of indigenous peoples. The work program requests from uh, the Jeff Council the approval of 539.2 million from the Jeff Trust Fund, which would be accompanied by 49.3 million in associated agency fees which represents about 15% of the entire Jeff 7 replenishment uh, allocation. The work program contains 48 projects, three, three new uh, programs, and two addenda to already approved programmatic approaches. The work program also contains four multi-trust fund projects that brings resources from the Jeff Trust Fund as well as from the Least Developed Countries Fund. If approved, 87 countries will benefit from the Jeff support, including 28, 25 sorry, least developed countries and 24 small island developing states. The work program brings 5.6 billion of expected co-financing. Uh, and I note that the portion of co-financing identified as investment mobilized amounts to 4.3 billion of this total or 77% of the co-financing total, which I think is a great accomplishment as well. To date, the total expected co-financing stands at 1 to 7.9. Uh, uh, we've investment mobilized for mix and UMIX that are not LDCs and SIDS, standing at 1 to 5.6 dollars. Both figures exceed the overall co-financing uh, uh, aspiration of the Jeff 7 cycle that was agreed during the replenishment. 14 of the 18 agencies are represented in the work program. Uh, UNDP is responsible for 30% of the demand, followed by UNAP and the World Bank, with 19% and 16.5% respectively. 
uh, in FAO and CI have 11.4 and 8.8% uh, shares of the work program, respectively. In GEF 7, 15 of the 18 agencies have received resources. FAO, UNDP, UNAP, and the World Bank have received the highest proportion of GEF 7 resources, varying from 13% to 32%. Climate change <coughs> and biodiversity together are responsible for 66% of the resources in this work program, followed by land degradation and international waters with 11% and chemicals and waste with 10%. The NGI window represents 6% of the resources uh, requested in this work program. 45% of the resources will be programmed through standalone projects, followed closely by impact programs with 40%. Other programs account for 9% and NGI for 6%. The proposed work program spans 87 countries. The distribution is fairly equitable across Latin America and Caribbean, Africa, and Asia. Africa is programming resources totaling 120 million, or about 20% of the total work program share, while Latin America stands at 123.7, or 21%. And projects and programs in the Asia region total 135.5, or 23% of all resources. Small island developing states will receive $50 million, which is a significant share of 8.96% of the work program funding. And Eastern and Central Asia would be receiving $52.5 million, or close to 9% of the funding. Finally, uh, the regional and global projects amount to 106.4, which includes the Blue Alliance project, the NGI investments, and the Inclusive Conservation Initiative. The work program brings forward the Sustainable Cities Impact Program uh, and also an addendum to the Food, Land Use, and Restoration uh, Impact Program. With this addition, a combined 23% of total country star resources will have been programmed through JEF 7 impact programs. The Sustainable Cities uh, Impact Program seeks to promote transformative shift in urban development by supporting cities to pursue integrated urban planning for impactful development outcomes, uh, which include global environmental benefits at scale. The program builds from the integrated approach pilot launched in JEP 6 and targets systemic drivers of environmental degradation in cities and emphasizes uh, uh, a holistic approach to tackling them for long-term sustainability and resilience. Led by UNAP, this program will be joined by nine countries spanning 24 target cities. The total amount projected for JEF 7 is 160 million, and this would be entirely programmed if the IP is approved as presented. It also brings significant co-financing of 1.7 billion, almost $10 for every dollar that the JEF is placing here. The Food and Land Use and Restoration Program was approved in June 2019, if you recall, with 18 countries across five continents. The addendum is requesting approval for five new country projects in Brazil, India, Nigeria, Paraguay, and Uganda. The five additional countries will enhance geographical reach and coverage of globally important commodities. With India joining the IP, the program now includes the South Asia region, and with Brazil and Paraguay joining, the impact program better captures the soy and beef landscapes and value chains in Latin America. And Nigeria and Uganda's inclusion provides greater scope for engagement with sustainable policies and practices for oil palm, cocoa, soy, and the coffee sectors. The work program includes an addendum to the Chemicals on Waste Islands program that was approved again in June whose objective is to prevent the buildup of materials and chemicals in the SIDS environment, specifically POPs, mercury, along with other harmful chemicals. The program originally included 27 countries in three regions. The addendum that we present add support to Bahamas, Cuba, and Dominica. For different regions, including the timing or ratifications of the chemicals conventions, these three countries, while originally interested in joining the program, were unable to join at that time. So these, the addition of these countries will enhance the reach of the program. 
We are also presenting uh, two other uh, major programs. Uh, the first is the African Mini Grids program, and the second is the Global Clean Tech Innovation Program. Renewable energy mini grids represent a viable solution for rural communities that are not expected to be reached by the electric grid. The Africa Mini Grids program will support 11 countries to increase energy access by focusing and reducing the cost of enhancing commercial viability of renewable energy from both residential and productive users. The program will uh, focus on mini grid cost reduction across hardware costs, soft costs, and financing costs. Finally, the Global Clean Tech Innovation Program will stimulate clean technology entrepreneurship in 10 countries. The program will provide tailored support to a business development and investment program to more than 1,000 businesses with potential to generate global environmental benefits at scale. It's a pleasure also to introduce the first three proposals for NGI-funded projects and blended finance. Uh, this is the first. Uh, this was the result of the first call for proposals for the NGI window, which resulted actually in significant uh, demand coming from agencies. We received uh, 19 fully developed projects, and out of this highly competitive uh, process, uh, we uh, were able to recommend three highly competitive and innovative projects that were selected through a strict screening process. One of these proposals will introduce a performance-based financing mechanism to unlock SME investment in circular economy initiatives in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. A second project will test financial platforms using equity in an open-ended fund that will channel capital flows from large institutional investors to support agriculture aggregators. And the third project consists of an equity fund that will invest in the startup companies in the ag tech sector seeking technological innovation with the ultimate goal of decreasing the intensity of use of natural resources in smallholder agriculture production. Overall, uh, these three projects take 25% of the total allocation for the NGI window in GEF 7. We also have uh, two other major projects that I would like to highlight with uh, also great innovation and impact potential, the Inclusive Conservation Initiative and the Blue Alliance for Marine Conservation. The Inclusive Conservation Initiative will assist indigenous peoples and local communities in their efforts to safeguard a significant fraction of Earth's natural ecosystems. As Rosina mentioned yesterday, approximately 25% of Earth's surface and ocean areas are being managed quite effectively by indigenous peoples uh, and local communities, in, in many cases with very good results. For instance, uh, forests uh, managed by indigenous peoples have been shown to be more effective than protected areas in reducing deforestation in the Amazon. While other initiatives do exist to as assist uh, indigenous peoples and uh, local communities, they tend to be uh, of a more limited scope. The Inclusive Conservation Initiative comes as a pilot to examine how this gap can be filled, allowing efforts to, on the ground to be scaled up to the scale that they deserve. I'm sure you're aware of the increase in the number of coastal and island countries that are committing to taking steps to conserve vast stretches of oceans under their ju jurisdiction, recognizing the tremendous benefits of such action can yield for both nature and their livelihoods. To build on this opportunity, the Jeff is joining with Conservation International, the Pew Charitable Trust, and two private foundations to form the Blue Nature Alliance with the objective to catalyze the effective conservation of at least 1.25 billion hectares, which represents 3.5% of the global oceans. It is, an estimated, it is estimated that the Blue, Alliance, Blue Nature Alliance will deliver 35% of the Aichi target to protect 10% of the global oceans. On the question of results, uh, the work program will deliver significant results across several indicators. For marine protected areas, over 100% of the target will have been reached in this work program. And it also adds 14% uh, to the land restored indicator, bringing it to close to 90%. The work program adds 24% to the indicator on greenhouse gases mitigated, now exceeding 60%. 15% is added to the indicator to improve management of shared, shared water systems, and more than 16% to POPs. 
To this date, the contribution of all impact programs to the four core indicators that best capture Jeff's results on land use and greenhouse gas emissions varies from 25, 21% to 70% of the Jeff 7 targets, which is impressive considering that STAR resources program through impact programs only represent 23% of the total resource allocation. The work program will also directly benefit 93 million people. And last but not least, all 47 full-size projects considered gender in the initial design, and 97% of these projects expect to contribute to closing significant gender gaps. I would like to conclude, uh, and I don't expect you to read in detail, but uh, this is a very interesting study that came out five days ago. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the lead author is our former uh, staff panel member, Sandra Diaz uh, from Argentina. And uh, it really looks, it's a synthesis of the IPBAS uh, report that really showed how, how, how close we are uh, to the collapse of many of the supporting uh, systems that uh, support humanity coming from nature and ecosystems. And it also points to the, to the need to really uh, uh, embrace uh, a systems change and also to uh, uh, start reducing our footprint on the planet. Since humanity depends on the out, directly on the outputs of nature, this decline uh, that we are witnessing and, and being able to very scientifically uh, document uh, will affect us just as it affects other species that share the planet with us. Yet only through accelerated transformation of the major economic systems, we will allow nature co to continue to provide for humanity. So I'd like to conclude uh, saying that nature through science is really calling on us in no uncertain terms to convey the message that the continued abuse of Earth's resources is threatening the provision of vital ecosystem that it provides to humanity. Her signals come through more frequent extremes of rainfall, droughts, and other destructive events, through increased land degradation and through decreases in productivity, and by the loss of biodiversity due to agricultural expansion, pollution, uh, load, and over-exploitation. So perhaps it's no accident that in the remote tropical forests of the Amazon's Guyana Shield, the only home of the white bellbird, scientists have recently heard one of nature's loudest calls, certainly the loudest call of any bird known to science. To put this in perspective, the sound level that's considered safe to our own ears is 85 decibels. The white bellbird call reaches 125 decibels or more which is louder than, uh, than a heavy metal rock concert. If you have been to one, you know what that means. And it's uh, louder than chainsaws. And perhaps, uh, I'm just saying, perhaps the white bellbird came to convey us a message from nature that, you know, how we're treating the planet. So with this, let me call your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo. This may be one of the most <laughs> interesting <laughs> presentations of the work program, and we are very much in competition with stopping the quality of the presentation or um, the level of the refreshment. Anyway, so uh, thank you so much for your attention. I would like to open the floor for your comments and the questions. and. Uh, yeah, reflections. Floor is yours. Apana first. So, I, I rarely go first uh, now, but today I'm inspired, right? <laughs> <laughs> By uh, Gustavo. So, uh, our constituency takes note of this uh, work program of uh, USD 588.50 million and uh, would like to endorse the work program. Uh, in addition, uh, we would like to take this opportunity to um, place on record uh, 
Our appreciation of the proactive approach of Jeff Secretariat, led from the front by CEO, in facilitating the recipient countries in aligning themselves with the programmatic directions of GEF-7 in their project proposals. I was part of the replenishment meetings and at that time I did have some concerns about whether the recipient countries will have the capacity to understand the, uh, the, the nuances of the programming but I'm very happy to report to the Council that uh, the um, workshops and the meetings and discussions that Jeff Secretariat has had in our constituency has helped the countries to not only submit proposals, but coordinate better with the uh, implementing agency and see that the proposals are in line with the programming direction. So thank you very much for that effort. I would also like to uh, note that uh, as compared to GEF-6, maybe, uh, this time the pace of processing of projects, proposals, has also improved, possibly because of the upstream work that was done by GEF Secretariat in ensuring that uh, project proposals are well prepared. I would like to congratulate Gustavo for this presentation. Apart from the uh, audiovisual at the end, I found the graphical representation of the deployment of GEF resources across various focal areas, across different uh, programs, and across regions extremely useful. So my request is to uh, uh, whether it would be possible to share this presentation it is not in the paper, it's really very good presentation uh, with, with us all council members on, uh, uh, on email. I would like to also note that uh, we are able to uh, move apace on different focal areas and also in different regions. This, um, this, um, uh, this um, attention will have to be sustained for an, at least another six to nine months to ensure that by end of mid of next year we are able to do the complete programming and I am very confident that uh, this team will be able to uh, do, do the same. I also noted the contribution of this work program to the um, projected benefits in the last but one slide and thank you also for that uh, um, attention to the wider environmental benefits that we are working for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Apana, um, for your recognition uh, on our effort. It's kind of, you know, we feel that, that our hard work paid off. <laughs> thank you. I'd like to uh, request uh, uh, sorry, the call on Kojira, followed by Kalola. So, um, thank you, Gustavo, for the very comprehensive present and also uh, attractive uh, presentation. Uh, we generally welcome the proposed resource allocation across focal areas and regions. We are pleased to see the growth in co-financing and the increased mobilization of private sector resources, notably through the non-grant instrument. We also welcome the broad distribution between agencies. Resources are re being requested by 14 out of 18, 18 agencies and that funding is balanced between focal areas. We note, however, that significantly less funding volume was committed to Africa and SITS than last time, and we hope this is not, uh, there is no, no system behind this. Um, regarding individual project proposals, we are pleased to see a number of very good proposals, as for example, the regional project mainstreaming climate change and ecosystem-based approaches into the sustainable management of the living marine, marine resources of the VCPFC, which is executed by uh, UNDP. We, rec we commend this project for the strong connection between environmental factors and socio-economic aspects and its engagement with both civil society actors and the private sector. The regional approach fosters transboundary cooperation in a sector that is crucial to sustain local livelihoods in the context of climate change. Similarly, we commend the project supporting a green economy, decoupling hazardous waste generation from ex economic growth in Rwanda which is also executed by UNDP. The project contributes to an improved enabling environment for sustainable economic growth in Rwanda, while directly engaging with the private sector. It also rests on a sound financing model and includes a relevant knowledge management plan. 
There are, however, also a couple of projects where we have more serious concerns on content and or quality and would therefore request the Secretariat sends draft final project documents for council review four weeks prior to CEO endorsement. This concerns the following projects. Conservation and sustainable management of lakes, wetlands and repairing corridors as pillars of a resilient and degradation neutral arrow basin landscape supporting sustainable, uh, yeah, uh, sustainable livelihoods in Uzbekistan. Um, circular economy regional program initiative by EBIRD, um, environmental sound destination of PCBs in Brazil by UNDP, El Salvador integrated landscape management and restoration by the World Bank, and sustainable Luangwa, securing Luangwa's water resources for shared socioeconomic and environmental benefits through integrated catchment management in Zambia by WWF US. As usual, we will provide our comments in writing with a determined time frame. Thank you so much. Um, now I want to call on Kalola, followed by Yoshiko. Thank you very much, Naoko, and thank you, Gustavo, for a very engaging presentation. And I'll try not to be as loud as the bird. <laughs> um, we welcome the, the work program um, and the different initiatives included therein. Uh, most notably also the Sustainable Cities Programme and the additional five countries in FOLU and the three NGI uh, product, projects. A few specific questions. One is uh, the way forward on attracting uh, non-grant projects. Will there be another call for proposals? Uh, second question is about the Sustainable Cities Programme. Um, you showed a very nice map as well on, on the screen and it, it very clearly shows the strong focus on middle-income countries. Um, whereas, of course, for example, in Africa, there is a large number of, of fast-growing cities uh, with large challenges for sustainable development. So why, isn't, why was this focus the outcome of the process? Um, we would have appreciated to see a larger focus on, on Africa. Um, on the Inclusive Conservation Initiative, um, a bit more information and especially which countries are uh, involved would be welcome. Um, we are happy obviously with the positive initial figures in terms of gender considerations and we would like to encourage you to continue to follow up on this during implementation. Uh, there were some very nice and informative uh, tables in the document. Um, it would be good to also know from you what is the share of LDC countries in terms of, of financing provided under this work program? Thank you. Thank you so much. I will call on Yoshiko, followed by Ro. I believe some other people were before me. I just wanted to. I'm um, sorry, I just not going <laughs> that list is provided. So, oh, but do, do you mind going uh, now? I, I think there were several, so I just wanted to be fair. <laughs> All right, then. So, um, well, thank you. We welcome this report, and we generally endorse the work program. I think it's a great list. Uh, the report includes disclosures of issues that were raised at the last council session, and really thank the Secretariat for its hard work for addressing them. To ensure institutional memory of that discussion, we also recommend posting the summary report of the rollout process for the GEF 7 impact programs that was shared with us in print at the last session on the website so that it can be used as reference by many stakeholders going forward. Um, we have some general comments uh, to make on the work program, some specific comments on projects which we may later uh, submit in writing. Um, first on the general points. Um, we, uh, on co-financing, co we certainly see a substantial welcoming rising co-financing ratio for this cycle, probably due to the increase in private sector participation. Our uh, question is that if this is a structural trend that should persist for a while, we'd like to have clarity on the current ability of the Secretariat to verify the financial flows and risks from a divergent group of stakeholders involved in the co-financing component. And second, uh, we welcome the pickup in the innovative financial schemes, such as the non-grant instruments in this reporting cycle. 
while still a small percentage, there seems to be an increase in participation by the GEF in the equity layer of the investment. And just wanted to confirm the organization's capability to handle risk analysis, management, and due diligence typically required to participate in the equity layer, and whether proper screening is also done on the fund managers who are involved and how the reporting of this could be done. This type of risk participation is decreased. We probably need to appropriately update the NGI policy for posting on the GEF website. And thirdly, um, for particularly large programs that involve multiple stakeholders, we'd like to see um, uh, compliance, obviously, with the stakeholder engagement policy and in line with the updated private sector engagement strategy. And we're supportive of the use of Secretary's use of the steering committees of work programs to entice the involvement of specialized international organizations in that genre to provide sanity checks and help with project design and due diligence to scale and avoid duplication of effort. However, we suggest that this process of inclusion be laid out more clearly to ensure a transparent and facilitative process. Uh, for example, how do such participants approach the GEF to get involved? And now drilling down into some of the project um, details, uh, first, first of all, I also want to say that we, uh, we think the project allocation order should favor countries on the DAC list as requested by several members of the last council session. And on specific um, country projects, especially with large stated co-financing ratios that involve many stakeholders, uh, we'd appreciate greater detail and confirmation ability of Jeff and its accredited agencies to conduct independent audits of such contributions, including verifying, assessing the abilities of involved parties to meet the obligations of this project. On um, project um, um, 10219, uh, uh, we think that several projects like that require more details on the target action to be funded uh, before any approval. Uh, for example, I think there's the need to specify what is meant by biodiversity-based businesses. Uh, project 10162, um, we thought that it was a little bit unclear what the concrete actions are being sought. For example, if it is to increase protective areas for migratory birds, such as designation of uh, Ramsar sites, for example, under the Ramsar Convention, then there's a question as to whether such a large scale of funding is necessary. And this is, again, why I think specialized convention bodies on a steering committee can provide some sanity checks and useful inputs of a device. Um, on uh, country projects uh, with large state co-finance, uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, on, on project 10349, um, while we acknowledge the environmental benefits of phasing out mercury, we wonder about the uh, scope of assistance because it's described in the document as phasing out all manufacturing enterprises in a country which is described as one of the largest manufacturers and exporters. So given these descriptions, we'd appreciate more information on how this assistance unequivocally would not serve as a subsidy, subsidy uh, reinforcing the market power some targeted companies at the expense of other firms is caution on page 20 of the most recent Jeff private sector engagement staff strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will call on Rob, followed by Lauren. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam Co-Chair. Thank you, Secretariat. As this is the, this is the first time I've intervened um, in this um, council session, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Rob Wing. I'm the new alternate council member from the United States. I'm very honored to be here, very excited to be participating in my first Jeff Council meeting. I look forward to getting to know all of you, and I'm working with you during this session and in the future. So thank you for that. Um, thank you to the Jeff Secretariat. Secretariat the implementing agencies, the recipient countries, for developing this fourth work program of GEF-7, intended to benefit 87 recipient countries, including 25 LDCs and 24 SIDS. We appreciate the work that has gone into the development of the work plan, and particularly appreciate the high percentage of co-financing that comes from the investment-mobilized co-financing co category. At the program level, we appreciate the strong focus on engagement with the private sector in the Sustainable Cities Impact Program, and we look forward to tracking how this engagement contributes to the durability of environmental benefits. We do, however, note the low representation of cities across continental Africa and hope the Jeff Secretariat could share if there is any intention 
on broadening the ge geographic scope of this um, impact program over time. On the Falur impact program, we welcome its geographic expansion and the resulting expanded representation of important value chains, including in the rice, wheat, soy, beef, palm, cacao, and coffee sectors. At the project level, we have some concerns about the operational conditions that will be faced by several projects, including the sustainable low emissions transport systems in Lebanon project, as well as the promoting carbon reduction through energy efficiency techniques in Baghdad city project, and the impact that these conditions will have on the durability of project impacts. We will follow up in writing with some more specific comments. On a more positive note, we welcome the focus on innovation and solid waste management in the private sector in the Circular Economy Regional Initiative non-grant instrument project and look forward to tracking this project closely. And finally, we welcome the Food Securities Fund Global Non-Grant Instrument Project for its potential to close the gap between international private capital and the growing demand for financing sustainable agricultural production and positively contributing to sustainable supply chains. We will be submitting detailed comments on the work program and request the Secretariat circulate several projects for a second review prior to CE endorsement. These include project numbers 10322, 10358, 10375, 10404, 10211, 10328, 10336, 10368, 10372, 10392, 10394, 10401, 10412, 10408, and 10409, as well as all child projects under programs 10408 and 1013. The additional child project under program 10387, and finally the Paraguay project of the full lower program. In addition, the United States requests that the following statements be reflected in the council meeting highlights. The United States, in light of its policies for, for certain development projects in countries whose governments are not addressing trafficking in persons and whose governments do not have in place a functioning and transparent military audit or which have violated human rights and in light of its policies on international ter terrorism, oppose the following projects and therefore does not join a council decision that would support Jeff projects 10088, 10374, 10391, 10349, 10366, 10387, 10400, 10178, 10413, and 10162. The United States, in light of its policies for certain development projects in countries whose governments do not have in place a functioning and transparent military audit, abstains from participating in the decision on Jeff Project 10352. Further, the United States remains concerned that development funds channeled to Cuba's agricultural sector would not achieve the intended development impact given its history of poor policy design and well-documented doc, well mismanagement of the sector and therefore opposes Jeff Project 10400 for this reason as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rob. May I call on Roren, uh, followed by Leonardo. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. We would like to thank the Secretariat for the overview provided in the work program and for the very informative presenta presentation. Uh, we note that the wor work program includes the first NGI projects, as you presented, under Jeff 7. We would like to better understand the process of assessing the PIFs and especially the role of the secretariats to the different conventions which the GEF is a financial mechanism for. We would like to understand if these convention secretariats are asked to comment on the PIFs in a similar way that the STAP does. And if this is the case, we would appreciate if the comments from the secretariats to the convention would also be posted on the website. We believe that this is um, according, this is provided for in the policy for the project program cycle. Um, we welcome very much the focus in the work program on small island developing states, um, as we believe that these projects are very much needed for these uh, island states. We note, however, that there are some non-OECD DAC eligible countries in the work program. And we would like to mention again that our funding to the GEF is ODA funding, like many other countries here, and we would like to be, that funding to be used in ODA eligible countries. 
We have um, many comments on, on the um, different projects, but we will send them in writing. Uh, but we'd li would like to make some comments on some projects and some more overall comments as well. When looking at the projects, we, we note that some would require a better risk analysis and better taking into consideration external risks triggered by local conditions. In some cases, there's also a need to be better aligned with national policies or strategies and ongoing institutional or legal processes that are relevant for the pro project in question. There's also sometimes a need to be, better, to be a better synergy with other similar projects or to build on lessons learned from other projects. Um, we believe that these are all elements that were discussed yesterday when we were discussing durability, and so we would really appreciate if in the screening this could be looked at, and we will provide some written comments on this. We'd like to provide just some comments on some of the projects, starting with the Sustainable Cities Impact Program. The program appears to involve, the, involve an ambitious coordination effort between four different international organizations, UNEP, ADB, UNDP, and the World Bank. If this coordination is successful, the, the project can potentially benefit from having four agencies with different areas of expertise and outreach. We, need, we note also for this IP that there's a high level of co-financing, almost 1.7 billion US dollars, but that this is mostly loans. We, we note that only 11.5 million dollars is expected from the private sector, and we would like to have a comment from the Secretariat on this. Um, regarding the, um, the NGI uh, on the Food Securities Fund, we're very positive to this NGI, to the focus. We think it's also well aligned with the Fowler Impact Program. But similarly to the comments made by Japan, uh, we note that FSF has a limited previous experience, uh, meaning that the GEF is taking a risk when investing in, in this fund. Uh, we would also like to see some provisions for co-investment uh, co opportunities. And just a general comment on the NGIs. We were wondering, in terms of the reflows from NGI projects, do the reflows go back to the, to the Jeff Trust Fund, or do they, are they invested in new NGIs? Um, we would like to also make some comments on the, the project in Ghana by UNIDO on circular economy, which we find very positive, since it's addressing issues of marine plastic pollution. Um, and we would like to note that Norway is currently supporting work by the Secretariat to the Basel, Stockholm, and Rotterdam Conventions in Ghana on marine plastic pollution. And we strongly encourage that this project by UNIDO builds on, on the project that we are currently supporting, because we think it would be very relevant. And finally, we have some comments on the Blue Nature Alliance. We're very positive to this project. We believe it addresses highly relevant ocean issues. And we urge that experiences and lessons learned from existing and past efforts are built upon. Uh, we also realize that the conservation areas are not yet determined, and we would like um, to, the selection of the conservation areas to be based on the, their importance in terms of biologic, biologically important areas. And we would also like to see some connections between the different uh, selected conservation sites. So we will provide some written comments within the deadline. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I want to call on Lenato, uh, followed by Ari. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Gustav, for your great presentation. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the constituency of Brazil, Colombia, and Ecuador, I would like to welcome with satisfaction the projects under this program of work and express our sincere thanks. We noticed, however, that all the focal points from our constituency were taken by surprise when they discovered the inclusion of one non-grant instrument project that involved our countries in this program. Although we commend the inclusion of the non-grant instrument project, we require that our focal points receive prior information about them so as they can be articulated with other national initiatives and their benefits be reported to the implementation of the conventions. In this regard, we'd like, we'll be happy to see the establishment of an information procedure with regard to, to the non-grants instrument projects that has already been requested in the last council session. Um, on another topic, I would like to make some brief comments regarding issues that countries from my constituency had in dealing with <clears throat> agencies in preparation of projects. We would like to call your attention to the fact that some of the projects in our region were not successfully approved 
for this work program due to the behavior of involved agencies that either changed the concept of the project entirely without prior communications to our government or did not inform our political or operational focal points correctly and timely for completion of the formulation process. This behavior led, in the case of Brazil, to the postponement of two important projects in the area of climate change and chemicals that should have been presented at the session. This also led to the unnecessary delays for the presentation of a project in the case of Colombia. Madam Chair, uh, these cases are a matter of concern for governments as they interfere with national capability and expertise involved in the development of projects. In the perspective of the countries involved, agencies must always demonstrate transparency and smooth communications with stakeholders throughout the, pro the, the project cycle. In this regard, we encourage the enhancement of communication channels between, <clears throat> between the secretariat, the agencies, and the focal points in the countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. May I call on Ari, followed by Latina. Thank you, Chair. And um, we also um, welcome the report, and uh, it's, uh, it's one of the good reports um, uh, in, in our concern we have been uh, presented. And then also the progress is uh, much better than the previous uh, years. Uh, well, le compared to June, uh, the submitted project, number of the submitted projects and the quality is increasing, which we are um, happy to see it. And then uh, the mostly for sustainable cities impact program, it is geographically uh, well balanced, I would say. And then also it is good to uh, see uh, the importance of uh, infrastructure and investment is highlighted as uh, the main uh, key uh, indicator of that project, uh, as a key component, sorry. And so we would uh, like to also ask um, the agencies to more focus on inv uh, infrastructure and nature-based solution when they are implementing um, the Sustainable Cities program. And then, uh, the lastly, uh, inclusive um, conservation initiative program. We also would like to see the number of the, the least of the countries going to be benefit from the program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Rachina, please, followed by Peter. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to thank the Jeff Secretariat for this work program, which includes seven projects from the Eastern African constituency. I would also like to commend the Jeff Secretariat for this innovative model of project implementation, which has been presented. Particularly, I'm referring to the project on electric mobility of Mauritius, which is designed to ensure coordinated engagement between the GF and the Green Climate Fund. We are using GF resources to establish the enabling environment and a pilot project, and provision has been made to use uh, GCF resources for scaling up. I hope that such coordinated engagement of adopted further in GF projects, which will strengthen collaboration between the GF and the GCF. And it also ensures that project sustainability are maintained. I would like also to add that uh, the holding of the national dialogues in different countries of our constituency has helped enormously in conducting the stakeholder engagement in early project identification and timely submission of projects to the GF Secretary. So I hope that such dialogues continue in forthcoming GF programs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Peter, please, uh, followed by Nanlike Manlike. Uh, thank you, Naoko, and also uh, thank you to Gustavo uh, for the presentation. Um, uh, we're able to um, offer full support for uh, this uh, diverse work program, the, uh, the second and the, the GIF 7 period, um, and welcome the content within it. Um, I'd also um, support uh, Aparna's request. 
if the, uh, the presentation materials could be made available to us, um, they are um, very clear and compelling and are very useful to us in our discussions with our uh, host governments and, and, and ministries back home. So um, I would welcome that. Uh, I just want to uh, mention a couple of quick things. Uh, one is uh, the significant amount of expected co-financing that uh, the current programme presents uh, from a range of sources, private sector, um, uh, public uh, agencies and other donors. Um, and, uh, you know, as we've set in Jeff Sivan, uh, you know, an overall target to increase the levels of, of co-finance from Jeff 6 and 6 from 5, um, this uh, shows that we, uh, we, we aim to be on, on target for that, so that's very welcome. Um, I will, um, without... Um, Picking favourites, and uh, I think though I do want to just mention two uh, programmes for uh, particular commendation. Um, one uh, is the inclusion, uh, or, sorry, the Inclusive Conservation Initiative, um, which I think is a pioneer initiative. Um, it's very, very welcome to see uh, the Jeff's first uh, dedicated uh, funded initiative that will focus entirely on Indigenous peoples. Um, uh, and uh, with larger grants, uh, that's a very, very welcome development uh, that merits specific uh, mention. And the second is to echo what some other colleagues have, uh, have already done by welcoming the three non-grant instruments. Um, we noted that there were none in the first work programme for Jeff Sivan, uh, but the notice that they were coming forward. Um, I'd like to commend the Secretariat for the, uh, running the, um, the request for proposals. Um, it was oversubscribed, and that is, can only be a good thing um, uh, that will encourage uh, continuing use of this uh, new permanent window as part of our programming architecture over the four-year replenishment cycle. Um, so it's, uh, given that we, uh, we secured that through the Jeff Seven replenishment, uh, it's important to see that it, it is being utilised. And within that, um, again, uh, without wishing to um, be silent on, on, on the other two, I do, do, do though just want to mention the Food Securities Fund, um, uh, 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 the global pro um, uh, project uh, under the, the non-grant infant in non-grant instrument program. Um, this is a, a very welcome initiative uh, that the, uh, the Jeff is investing in. Um, we heard uh, yesterday when we had our session with the private sector advisory group um, of the, the catalytic um, uh, uh, potential of impact investing. And this fund of funds model is, um, is squarely in that, uh, in that model. Um, as uh, I think uh, Rob mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's the key uh, link between significant pools of international private capital, but drawing them down to the local level um, with, um, uh, with a view of um, sustainable agricultural production. And that's, that, that bridging role is precisely what the non-grant instrument window is designed to deliver and, uh, and, and commend the Jeff for, um, uh, for pursuing this. So uh, with that, um, and uh, noting that I only picked two of the work program, uh, I'd just like to re reiterate um, our support uh, for the full um, work program and uh, the, uh, um, the outcomes that uh, we expected to deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. May I call on uh, Manrique, followed by Stephanie. Muchas gracias, Naoko. Thank you very much, Naoko, and good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Southern Cone constituency, we support this work program, and we are pleased to see the inclusion of projects for countries that we represent. We agree with what Brazil said when uh, they spoke on the part of their constituency. And they referred to projects referring not only to Ecuador, Brazil, but also countries of our constituency, Paraguay. There are other countries in the region, Costa Rica. But it would be very important, as Brazil just said, for there to be a more predictable mechanism so that our country, so that our policy and operational focal points will be informed of the non-grant programs. And this is especially so because in many of our countries were just now 
defining the way for the private sector to get involved in these projects. So it's important for us to be able to know when these projects are going to be approved, how they're going to work in our countries. Now, regarding the Argentina project, and that's a child project as part of the city impact uh, program, we're very pleased with the support that we receive from Jeff. And we appreciate the approval of the program. We just want to say it's important to realize how important this project is for our country. In Argentina, about 92% of the population lives in cities. And in the project, if you read the concept note, you will see that there are five cities that are involved. One of them is Ushuaia. That is the southernmost city in the world. And consequently, Ushuaia is especially affected by climate change and the effects on the Antarctic. And those effects affect the biodiversity of the region. Now, the city of Buenos Aires, uh, metropolitan Ushuaia, there, there are 20 million people living in Buenos Aires. And that represents a challenge in terms of transportation, infrastructure, waste management, and also involvement of biodiversity. So in this connection, we think it's very important for Jeff to continue to support countries like Argentina. And regarding some comments that we have heard today and yesterday, too, we would like to return to a concept that we feel is essential, i.e., the middle income indicator, the per capita income, has absolutely nothing to do with the challenges faced by a country in the area of climate change or biodiversity or decertification. So this isn't something that should be included in these fora. That is our opinion. And it would be important for us to find other measurements. For example, loss of biodiversity. Something that could show how a region is affected by climate change. And that would be the best way to uh, influence our upcoming discussion on our next replenishment. Thank you. Thank you. I want to call on Stephanie, followed by Anna. Merci. Bonjour à tous. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all. I would like to speak French. We would like to thank the Secretariat for this new work program that is quite ambitious, that brings the commitment to, of Jeff to 50 percent with a distribution in geography that is quite uh, a good equilibrium, co-financing that is quite high, projects and programs that are really significant on islands, for instance, and durable cities, the inclusive conservation initiative, the alliance, Blue Island, Island uh, Blue Alliance. We approve of this program. But four main agencies are really in ahead of the 14 others, and we hope that all projects will confirm a better diversification between agencies. And we would like to thank their, the efforts of agencies that will offer their projects and the Secretariat that will uh, make recommendations to have a better diversification of all agencies on all FEM GIF 7. I have a doubt as to the cohesion between the, the table four and the presentation this morning. I think that it was not presented in the same way. 
That might explain it. If Table 4 is to be believed, the work program should have progress on Indicator 2, especially for marine areas and restoration of soils, which would be 95 percent. But still, the other targets on biodiversity and Indicators 1, 4, 5, and 8 would not reach the objectives that we have decided upon. And then Jeff 7 will, in the future, reach the objectives, I think. Norway, we agree with you as to funding to countries that are non-eligible. And France is committed to public aid to development. And we would like to remind the agencies and the Secretariat the importance of taking into account the framework and other projects that are being held in countries for a good co coordination, non-duplication, efficiency, efficacy, efficacy, and uh, for interventions of all donors. Uh, other uh, comments will be sent to you via email. Thank you. Thank you so much. May I call on Anna, followed by Stefan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we welcome this report and endorse the work program. And we will be following up in writing with some detailed comments on specific projects. But I also wanted to offer some overall comments. Um, with respect to gender, we are encouraged to see that gender has been considered in all 47 full size projects in their initial design and that the vast majority expect to close gender gaps. We would, however, like to see even more progress made given that only a handful specifically address, uh, specifically address gender and describe how these projects intend to benefit women. Um, in terms of the Blue Nature Alliance, we very much welcome this initiative and we're pleased to see the work being done in this area and particularly the focus on collaboration with other organizations. Um, but like Norway, we would also encourage uh, the Jeff to build on lessons learned on pre uh, from previous uh, work in this area. And finally, um, we would, uh, like the Netherlands, also like to see a larger focus on Africa and we would uh, therefore request some more information on the share of resources that is going to LDCs. And also like to highlight that given that our funding comes from official development assistance that we would like to see a greater focus on uh, ODA eligible countries. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Stefan, followed by Ben. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I like the bird, um, and you have to ask your colleague if the call of the bird has become louder over the years. It could be, well, that it is a, a call of uh, alarm and urgency of action. Um, with that, we would like to thank the Secretariat, the agencies, the countries, for the effort that went into this work program. It uh, presents uh, impressive ex-ante expected environmental benefits and sizable mobilization rate. Um, that means we are looking forward to solid monitoring so that these expected results also materialize, thorough evaluation. Um, on that one, one of my hobbies, the 93 million people that will benefit from this uh, program, um, there we have to come to gris grips with uh, better um, measuring, you know, it's not just counting the people, it's counting to what extent do they benefit. I know that uh, STAP and others are working on it. Um, we will limit our comments to um, um, more, more groups of project. Uh, on land degradation, we welcome the link of these projects to biodiversity, climate change and water. Uh, we also note that there's a focus on value chains, and the value chains very often uh, tend to look into international value chains, export. Uh, uh, in that respect, we urge the agencies and the Secretariat to also uh, take up local and national value change and food systems, very critical, especially for the um, uh, poor parts of the population. 
On international waters, um, perhaps because several of our constituency countries are landlocked, one is even a double landlocked country, um, we, we note uh, the importance, of course, of, of uh, marine action, but we, um, we uh, urge uh, all agencies and the Secretariat not to forget the, the poor cousin, the fresh water, the fresh water that in many areas of this world are particularly affected by climate change. Um, some of you may have seen the uh, dreary and scary pictures of Victoria Falls that is dwindling down. So irrigation comes with a few exceptions of very wealthy countries that can afford desalinization, still comes from fresh water, so don't forget the poor cousins. On the blue, Nature Alliance, it's a nice name, um, sounds good. We would like to know more about, are there any terms of reference? Is it uh, open-ended when it comes to time and membership? And what is the exact role of the uh, Jeff in this alliance? On the non-grant instruments, we uh, welcome and command all the um, participants in it. Um, the organizational capacity that was uh, mentioned by some of the colleagues. Um, uh, we expect that the uh, JFSEC is in, a, is in a position to follow up on, on the activities. It's slightly different from what the usual business of the JEF used to be, like the equity fund, for instance. We're not against it, understand this right, but we say we have to have the right things in place. Um, on, on this and on the water, we will follow up with some specific comments. And then finally, the city's um, um, impact program. We note, like others, that Africa is uh, not overly represented, um, Central Asia not at all, but especially Africa, um, if we're not wrong, it's the continent with the fastest urbanization. So. Um, perhaps there is room to include some more um, African cities. Uh, we also note the change in the lead agency, and we expect that this uh, changing of the guard will not um, mean that we lose uh, some of the valuable experiences that um, were acquired under Jeff 6. We also note that uh, three organizations um, will be working along with UNEP, um, C40, ECLE, and WRI, all very noble and competent organizations. We'd like to know more about the precise working modalities because they are not JEF agencies. And so are they just implementers or are they playing a, a major role? If it says work along with UNEP, um, this is too fuzzy for us. Um, the whole part about the, the, the soft part, the global platform, uh, we believe um, needs uh, very careful um, attention that we avoid duplication. Um, cities are crowded spaces also when it comes to sustainability activities. So um, while exchanges and dialogues and workshops may be helpful, uh, we should always keep in mind that um, they are under um, specific jurisdictional uh, systems. So if a city does not have um, the authority to levy taxes, but depends mainly on, on transfer payments, uh, a workshop amongst peer may not be that helpful because how do you finance the great ideas that you learn from others? So I'm sure you will keep track of that one. Um, we look forward to seeing, um, especially to the sustainable cities, the child projects, um, providing greater clarity uh, on this proposal, including on how the results will be monitored and evaluated. But thank you very much for the efforts that went into this work program. Thank you. May I call on Ben, followed by Feturi. Uh, thanks, Naoko, um, and um, many thanks to uh, Gustavo for the uh, very useful presentation. Um, and it's, it's really good to see the progress uh, being made against the use of uh, Jeff 7 resources. 
Um, let me go through a, a number of, sort of high-level points. We'll also, as others, will be sending some comments, written comments uh, after this as well within the time frame. Uh, so we welcome, uh, we welcome the Sustainable Cities Impact Programme has been included uh, uh, this time. So it's good to see that up and running and, and all the impact programmes as well moving forward. And it's particularly good to see, as Gustavo mentioned, the, the contribution of those to the, the, to the results um, to the overall uh, GEF7 uh, replenishment. Um, it's useful to be useful to clarify how the Sustainable Cities uh, Impact Programme relates to and is complementary to other initiatives. And, and similarly as made by others, I think Carola mentioned the question in terms of uh, there seems to be quite a sort of high proportion of mix within the, the cities being included within that Sustainable Cities programme. Um, however, the, the, the programme has been delayed um, and obviously it's an important impact programme, so it's good to get that moving. Uh, we welcome the prominence of programming on the International Waters Focal Area, uh, given the low level of uh, programming to date. Uh, the UK strongly supports the, the Blue Nature Alliance uh, global project to target creation of ambitious and significant set of new marine protected areas. Um, the question, question though, is uh, Jeff Secretary confident that programming in subsequent work programs uh, will, in, will in, uh, ensure that the international waters reaches its Jeff 7 uh, focal area target allocation? Um, in terms of the non-grant instruments, we welcome that they have been included uh, this time. It's good to see that moving forward. Uh, but uh, like others, I think Japan mentioned this point was uh, in terms of ensuring the capacity is there to deal with and screen such uh, projects, which obviously are somewhat different. Um, uh, then we also note, as others have, uh, the 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 uh, maybe low proportion of uh, LDCs, and it's useful to get some clarification on that. It's sort of a similar point which was made yesterday uh, regarding the, the deep dive of the SGP. Um, and also, as, uh, as with Lauren, we note the, the, uh, the non-ODA countries uh, being included in this uh, program. However, the UK is very happy to endorse this work program, and we'll provide some written comments to follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. May I call on Fetri, followed by Dan. Thank you, Madam uh, Co-Chair. I think yesterday in my brief intervention, I make reference to the foot at Western Shoe. Well, I happen to represent that foot. Why? I think this is the climax of any meeting, especially when the draft work program is being considered. So. As a representative of a uh, no, constituency of 17 member states, 15 of whom are small island developing states, and uh, we also include Indonesia and the Philippines. So my thank you is twofold. Firstly, to the Secretariat for the draft work program, which uh, we fully support. Secondly, to those behind the scene, the agencies, member states, they are the ones who do the heavy lifting. And yet they really get to come to center stage is always uh, you know, us council members who get to discuss uh, and also get to consider this. So I, I think I want to acknowledge their, their work and their support without which we wouldn't have a comprehensive work program as uh, been presented. I think it's fair to say that for our 17 member constituency, by and large, the majority has a funding proposal that has been included whether it's under the impact programs or the standalone uh, full-size program, the multi-focal areas, the multi-trust fund projects, and even the non-expedited enabling activity. I think that means a lot. And uh, I think uh, I'm always making reference to my friend uh, Stefan. He makes reference to the fact that uh, you know, there are countries who are landlocked. The constituency I represent, we are ocean-locked. So much so that our leaders have uh, declared that uh, you know, we are the blue ocean continent. So it's very encouraging to see that uh, you know, there is, uh, these are international waters. Mm -hmm. I think we are, we, are, we, are, we are trying to put together a, a, a funding proposal with the help of UNEP and also our, our regional organizations. So hopefully you know, that will be uh, materialized. So in closing, I know Samoa also has a funding proposal. It hasn't you know, made its way to the work program. But it doesn't matter. I think it's time will come. 
And even when we are not here, I'm sure other council members will see you know, the merits of it, will support it. I think my underlying message is, you, you mentioned the frustration in terms of the, how many weeks we spent in Madrid, but this is what it all means. When we have funding proposals, when we come to CHEF with uh, you know, an element of trust, hoping that the international community will respond positively, you are doing that. And again, I just want, on behalf of my constituency, to place on record our deepest appreciation to the Secretariat, to our partners. Without their support, we wouldn't have a work program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Petri. Um, may I call on Dan, followed by Onila. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Thank you, Gustavo, for your presentation. That was very rich. And I would like to join my other members here to send the presentation that was really synthetic and rich. A good synthesis. Madam Chair, yesterday, in your first speech, you underlined the important role of Jeff for in challenges that are global. And um, after Madrid, you said, this program, we would like to support it. Uh, we appreciate it, but some of my colleagues said so. We will have all, especially agencies, to have a zooming on Africa, to have a focus on Africa. For the countries that I represent here, I would like to be witness to that. My discourse will be on some programs, the impact program for durable cities and the private sector. In Madrid, for our delegation from Niger, uh, five of the members were presidents of municipalities. It's the case for many uh, African delegations. And they all understood they, will have, they would like to have green cities. Uh, that's why agencies should help us in this regard. We, each time our request, so the PIF has a program on green cities. Jeff, all the mechanisms have a program on cities, and we would like to have more information on such. So I think that that is what I witnessed. We have another project, and I know that in my uh, group we have many requests. So you have a, pro a project for 36 communities or cities for the environment, but all the mayors for these communities that came and presented the, themselves to elections wanted to show the pertinence of what we're doing and how our communities are for us. Today, they have become parliamentarians for the climatic change. They came to Madrid for most of them. So this is a, a proof. So we should take into account our capacities for our private sector, nationally, the capacities of our cities. We have to do something. We spent two weeks saying that action time has come. It has to be done everywhere. But we have to take into account the capacities of each, each region. The second comment on the gender concept. Very often in projects, the, the understanding of this concept, well, Sometimes we think that a few lines should be written to talk about gender. But gender for us, as you, when you look at our proposals, especially for women and youth, it is not only 
their participation in our project, but it's because we have understood that for strengthening of the basis in agriculture and women and youth are part of the solution. They have to be. This is essential. We even have indicators where we show that up to 60 percent and more of our action should be committed to women, dedicated to women and young people. This proves it. And very often we, we are given statistics, but the participation has to be done, basically. And to conclude, we would like to go back to the agencies, and I hope that the agency will be able to have a written feedback regarding focal points to inform them as to what will happen after having instructions from their project. We have to have feedback so that we ourselves could show that such project did not go to uh, the council. They will see the comments. They will see if there are improvements to be brought. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to call on Orunida, followed by Marita. Thank you, Madam Chair. So thank you very much, Gustavo, for your detailed and very active presentation. Thank you for this. Please let me start from uh, the smart cities. Yes, we all know that uh, smart cities, they are environmental solutions for our countries. But in the end, and in, 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 um, I think in, this will begin from smart people and smart humans and in, le in less smart, smart students, smart new generation. And uh, why I'm saying this? Because in my country and in the countries that uh, that I am presenting here, we are having uh, some Jeff projects, but we are buying expertise. We don't have our own expertise, so we have we don't have the sustainability of these projects. And um, we have in this kind of uh, projects, the first objective should be to create our own expertise, our sustainability, our own infrastructure. For example, you told about, uh, you had, uh, I think, a paragraph in your presentation about the regional collaboration in Balkans. Yes, we have a very good regional collaboration in Balkans. And uh, as I said yesterday, it was about the Rhine River. And, uh, but we have a very good paper and a very good strategy now for four countries for the Rhine River. And, but we don't, we don't have labs how to measure the impact of uh, this kind of waters without labs in our countries. We are four countries without labs. We can't measure the, uh, the elements, the, I don't know, organic or inorganic elements of this water, of microorganic elements of with this water. So we are creating only strategies and only plans how to measure all this, but we don't have the facilities. Um, and for this, it will be uh, better in, in your impact projects or impact program to have the right importance of the infrastructure and investments that we, uh, we uh, need as countries, as small countries. And uh, the next one, it, it was, I, I really like the board, but uh, I hope that the next presentation in the next council uh, meeting, it will be about the Egyptian vulture, because it's a very good example how we can um, coordinate and how we can um, not only co-finance, but measures and having results of our co-financing. And I will explain you why. Because we have an, uh, a very good biodiversity GEF program and another program about a uh, national program about the agriculture and agrotourism. And uh, we have created with the farmers some, uh, some centers 
when we uh, provide food to this bird. And it's a bird in risk, in very big risk now. And for the first time, it is a um, biological, uh, uh, let's say, uh, curiosity that for the first time we have uh, our cameras show to us that we have two birds in a family for the first time in the, in the last decade, decade, maybe. And for the first time, they are two birds now migrating to the Egyptian uh, mountains. So uh, this showed to us that if we are finding um, innovative solutions, how to coordinate GEF projects with other projects and not only co-finance, Jeff projects. We can do our best and we can have best, uh, best results. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. And in the, in the next meeting, maybe uh, we have to talk not only about co-financing, but co-results. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last speaker of the session, Marita. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we would like to record our um, approval of the, of the work program. Um, we especially welcome the relatively high co-financing ratio that the program is expected to achieve. Uh, also, the increased focus on oceans and as well as on land titles of indigenous uh, populations. Um, I don't want to repeat what everybody else has already said, so um, I will um, just uh, I go on record supporting the comments on gender by the Netherlands and, and Canada. Um, we also agree um, with Canada, Norway, and others on um, the, the comments on old eligibility and the need for more focus on LDCs and Africa in future work programs. Thank you. Thank you. Now I want to uh, invite a CSO network, a CSOs. Uh, good morning once more. Uh, my name is uh, Roger Sluviro. I'm the chairperson for the Zambia Sibirian Forum, uh, Zambia and Southern Africa. I will be sharing the reflections of the Civil Society Network on the work program. We appreciate the proposed work program and the opportunity to share reflections on it. We welcome in particular the proposed inclusive conservation initiative as noted in the work program, an estimated 80% of the world's biodiversity is held in areas and territories governed or managed by indigenous peoples and local communities. Yet many indigenous peoples and local communities lack secure rights and meaningful recognition and support for their customer institutions and actions to govern and manage their resources and conserved areas and territories. We strongly encourage Jeff to make the Inclusive Conservation Initiative Project Implementation Document available for our further review. Based on the summary of the initiative in the work program document, we recommend the following. The language describing the initiative should be consistently make clear that it pertains to indigenous peoples and local communities. The initiative should be firmly based on the leadership of indigenous peoples and local communities, including in all related decision making, planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation, and should recognize and appropriate support the continuation and enhancement of their self-determined collective action for conservation in their territories and areas. The eight to 10 countries where the initiative will be focused should collectively cover origins. The proposed agencies for the initiative should address the partial compliance gaps identified in the GEF assessment of GEF agencies compliance and with minimum standards as a matter of agency. Regarding the process through which this and other GEF work programs are developed, it is critical that civil society, indigenous peoples and local communities are engaged in development, implementation, and monitoring of GEF projects at all stages in order to utilize their capacity to provide support for effective, equitable project approaches and impacts. This requires clear 
accessible information about project de development processes and mechanisms. We also recommend that those developing and approving projects consider and build on the lessons from biodiversity conservation by indigenous peoples and local communities and the results of other GEF projects in the area, including in particular the small grants program. Uh, finally, IFI GEF Civil Society Network is to provide meaningful feedback on the work program we request that it be posted online as far in advance of the council meeting as possible, no less than a month, so that we can meaningfully consult our networks. We, are all, we also have reflections on a number of other specific projects and impact programs within the work program. Sustainable Cities Impact Program. We recommend that the major elements of transformational change be more clearly defined and that the program more clearly address the rights of peoples in cities who are landless, homeless, or poor. On food, land use, and restoration impact program, we appreciate that the project has a strategy for stakeholder engagement through horizontal and vertical dimensions and recommend that it include a clear strategy to promote agroecology and the role of women in food production and land restoration. Integrated transboundary river basin management for the sustainable development of the Lipompo River Basin. We note this is a critical project for water systems in the region. We recommend that it aim to address more strategic concerns that affect water availability and quality. Include capacity building for community engagement in water resources management and land use planning at the community level including through community rights and land use mapping, and otherwise incorporate dedicated efforts to support communities as key actors in the management of the basin. We will, we will be submitting more detailed comments on the work program in writing for your consideration. And as I conclude, we would like to humbly request if you could share a copy of the background presentation that you did before we started the session. I thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we uh, would like to respond and to your inquiry and the comments, but at the outset, I really would like to thank you, the council, uh, for uh, your actually support uh, for this uh, work program. I feel that uh, we are kind of, we received uh, quite a recognition of our ambition, our commitment to really uh, serve you the, to, to the maximum that uh, extent we could do. So thank you so much for that. And while we, of course, did not try to uh, address the all comments and uh, concerns on the inquiries presented to us. And the first thing I could uh, promise is, yes, we will share uh, the Gustavus and the slide to all of you. And I hope the buzz, the, the voice can be also <laughs> carried and then uh, reach, uh, reach to you. So with that, I'd like to invite Gustavo and the team to respond to, to your comments. Thank you very much, Naoko, and thanks to all of you. Uh, all your comments, both the very positive ones and the constructive ones, are, are uh, taken with uh, great appreciation, and we'll sh make sure that they do reach uh, the agencies and that we have that uh, usual dialogue and cooperation of your comments and your considerations. Uh, uh, both at this stage as well as during uh, project preparation. So we welcome your written comments. Uh, we, we try to capture as much as we can here, but uh, we can't really uh, make uh, justice of, a, of the richness of your comments uh, unless they come to us in, in written form, and we'll make sure that they have, uh, we, we deliver them. Uh, I'll try to now uh, um, answer the specific questions on a series of points, uh, particularly those that uh, that I think uh, were of interest uh, to, to, to several council members. Uh, I'll start with inclusive conservation, which is, a, again, a, a very interesting, and uh, we are very uh, excited with this opportunity to open up a new, uh, a new business line for the GEF that uh, focuses exclusively on indigenous people and their role in, uh, in being stewards of, uh, of biodiversity, uh, also uh, stewards of uh, most of the uh, land-based uh, carbon stocks. And this will be, people ask about uh, you know, how, how, what countries are gonna be uh, the target. 
of this. This is going to be determined during the project preparation through uh, the call for proposals and a set of criteria that you have included in the project, including uh, being eligible uh, in the Jeff system to receive funding, uh, areas of high biodiversity, of globally relevant biodiversity, uh, significant uh, uh, carbon stocks, uh, the presence of uh, indigenous peoples uh, on the ground, uh, uh, and also uh, a diverse set of activities that uh, they will propose uh, to be to be uh, uh, funded uh, in their ideas. So we, we will report on those uh, later on in the process. But I, I'd like to use this opportunity to really uh, thank uh, very uh, sincerely not only uh, the agency, CI and UCN, that uh, prepared this, but uh, the Indigenous Peoples Advisory Group. Uh, you know that Jeff has an Indigenous People Advisory Group, and they have really been the, the, the driving force behind guiding us through this and uh, making sure that we reflected in this uh, in this proposal uh, what uh, do they need. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Lucy, who's here. To, Lucy, in the back, please, please. And, uh, and Giovanni. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. And so we couldn't have done this without you and your colleagues on the IPAC. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like now to talk, touch on, on the NGI, the set of questions on the NGI. Uh, yes, uh, there will be another call, and the idea is to uh, uh, issue these calls, and, and we want to make, to make it uh, uh, a, new a new call for proposals in January, uh, very early in January, as soon as we can, because we need to have uh, the opportunity for agencies to prepare uh, competitive projects, and we'll do that until the resources are exhausted from that window. At the same time, we don't want the, to, to, to use all the window uh, just for the sake of it, but all the, uh, on looking at innovation, looking at complementarity across different uh, focal areas. And this is, again, for the amount of money we, we have been allocated, $138 million. It's still quite a pilot in, in, in a sense, but we want to operate in the areas of a higher risk that are not really yet marketable. So we're not doing a lot on renewable energy because the market has taken uh, good care of that by now. So we, we will do that. Um, there was a uh, question about NGI reflows. NGI reflows, and I hope you, 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 you may have seen an information paper on reflows from the NGI. So we already uh, report on the reflows that are coming in. I think we have $67 million, if I'm not mistaken, and more uh, to come. These resources go back to the Jeff Trust Fund, uh, and uh, they get repurposed. Um, and, uh, and there is a, 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 another uh, angle to this. Uh, countries are, of course, entitled to use their star resources uh, in NGI, uh, in an NGI form. If they do that for revolving funds and other, on other means, they, can, they get to, to, to keep the, the, the proceeds of those investments. So the NGI window requires reflows to the trust fund. The usage of star resources in non-grant instruments uh, do, does not. So that's, a, that's an opportunity that exists if countries are willing to take that to use that opportunity. Uh, the question of, uh, of uh, the capacity to, to screen these projects and to bring them uh, to you, and uh, we, we, you all know that we operate in, in, in as a partnership uh, across uh, several agencies, and uh, there are some agencies that uh, do have a lot of capacity, and part of our screening process is whether the proponent agency does have uh, the ability to, to, to really do a good job in, in structuring these deals and the screening for themselves for uh, the, the right set of uh, uh, structures and opportunities and deals that they need to do. In, in the case that uh, you have before you, you have EBRD, which is a, an investment bank, a public investment bank. Of course, they do have tremendous capacity. We have the uh, IDB Invest, which is the private arm of the Inter-American Development Bank, also does this routinely and also Conservation International, which has been, for the past 15 years, uh, uh, pioneering a lot of uh, these uh, green deals, uh, including bond, issuing bonds and, and others. So there's a, a lot of capacity in that. But uh, at the level of Secretariat, we do a lot of the screening on the impact side. Will this uh, potentially generate uh, significant impact uh, for one or more focal areas? But we also count on uh, on an advisory group that uh, was formed as part of the replenishment uh, uh, request. And the, 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 this group uh, are, is made of a highly uh, uh, 
experienced uh, 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 private sector folks, particularly on the investment side, and they provide pro bono uh, uh, advice to us. So we, we meet with them and we, uh, they, they provide you know, very clear uh, input. Of course, the, 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 the guidance that they give is, not, is non-binding because this is just a, an advisory role, but we have taken them their, their counsel very seriously and uh, they add a lot of value to the work that we do. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, and agencies, of course, will carry due diligence. They are in turn responsible for putting tenders out to select asset managers to respond to Yashiko's question. And all of that you know, follows the, the procedures and the standard procedures uh, of, uh, of business, good business practices uh, in the investment side. Uh, we'll do, uh, we, we thought uh, to the question about uh, informing the countries, we, we, we had the impression that we sent uh, calls for proposals to every focal point, every agency, every convention. Uh, so we, just like we, we sent to, to uh, uh, communications uh, to council members, uh, we, we, we try to do our best. If you, if you haven't received, you know, we, we apologize, but we don't know what happened, but this was sent to, to uh, in accordance to all of our list uh, of server and uh, hopefully uh, it won't happen again for s some of you. And agencies, uh, uh, the NGI projects need not be uh, uh, endorsed by governments, and this is uh, on purpose because this is all private sector oriented, but agencies should uh, use their practice of informing uh, the respective uh, countries and, and, and focal points about the, particularly at the, at the design phase, so that you know, the governments can also have a significant uh, uh, participation in this, so we make sure that uh, they, they understand that. Uh, the question about uh, uh, Africa and uh, in the Sustainable Cities Program, uh, we have, uh, of course, three uh, countries uh, in Africa in the, in the current, uh, in the current uh, Sustainable Cities uh, proposal. They are very strategic cities in Africa, it's Kigali, a free town in Sierra Leone and Marrakesh in Morocco. Uh, we also have three in Asia and three in Latin America. So there is, uh, a, a, you know, a very uniform, uniform distribution of, of cities, with uh, for the resources that we have available for that. And I'd like to remind that this is a, a, a continuation and an aggregation to what we've done in Jeff Six to the IAP. And Jeff Six includes three uh, uh, African countries: uh, one in South Africa, in Senegal, and Ivory Coast. So uh, uh, for, for the size of the, pro, uh, of the program and for the, the objective of being as, uh, as widely distributed as possible, I think it's, uh, it's reasonable to have uh, what we have today. So we have six countries out of 17 uh, countries supporting Jeff 6 and Jeff 7 coming from Africa. Uh, so that, uh, that's that. And just following up on that point about Africa, or, sorry, about LDCs, uh, I can't respond to you right on the spot, the, the share of resources, but uh, as we reported, 25 uh, countries, uh, 25 LDCs are uh, being uh, supported in, through this work program. Uh, if we, we remind ourselves that uh, there are 47 uh, LDCs, this is more than 50%, I think 54, 55% of LDCs are included. Uh, the other point is that we funded everything, uh, that we are financing for everything that was technically cleared by the deadline for this work program. So in other words, we, 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 we do the best that we can to, to elicit uh, with the agencies and, and our contacts with uh, countries, projects from uh, particularly vulnerable uh, countries and LDCs. But at the end of the day, we have to respond to the demand and we can't force that demand to emerge, but we do the best that we can. And I think overall, it's, it, it's quite a significant um, support that we are looking at that. There was a question about uh, sustainable cities, uh, uh, the impressive amount of uh, co-financing and, uh, and the point about a significant piece of that being in the form of loans, which is correct. But uh, we have to understand that uh, many of these loans are actually driven to, uh, uh, to benefit uh, the creation of conditions and markets for private sector to take on uh, additional investments. So it's, uh, it's, it's, these loans are catalytic to the process and uh, actually we haven't included the potential uh, additional co-financing would come from the loans themselves in terms of generating additional businesses in, this, in these cities, but uh, this is the, for the most part, the objective of the loans in addition to the direct private sector 
contribution that has been included uh, in the, in the co-financing ratio. Um, the Blue, Na uh, Blue Nature Alliance, uh, thank you for the supportive comments. And there were questions about, uh, about the Jeff role in, uh, in this. And this is a, an interesting, uh, I'd say, typology of a, of a multi-stakeholder uh, engagement of platform in which uh, uh, four at this stage and five, including Jeff, major uh, donors came with, uh, with hard cash to try to trigger something that was uh, impossible for any one of us uh, to do it alone, which is to speed up the process of uh, expanding the coverage of marine protected areas uh, uh, on, on a global scale. Uh, the Jeff, uh, as a founding donor, uh, will be in, this, uh, in the steering committee and, and hopefully will be able to push for uh, the areas that get selected, and they get selected according to a series of criteria that you'll find in the proposal, including areas of high biodiversity, again, high uh, carbon sequestration potential, uh, potential for fisheries recovery with livelihoods, uh, uh, spillover benefits, and all of that. But we'll make sure that uh, the global environmental benefits are there. In other words, we, we wouldn't have that ability if we try to do it either alone or if the partnership went uh, on its own direction. Uh, so this is a very good thing. And it's not a close partnership. We, we are actually uh, CI, which is the lead agency for this, is already receiving indications that others may, may come. We have uh, met uh, with a couple of other donors that don't want to be known by now that you know, found this very interesting. So this, is, this can be quite a catalytic of other, other uh, participants. Um, let me see what else. Question about uh, IW. Yeah, yeah, we, we try to catch up on uh, international waters uh, programming in this work program, and we'll do even more in the next. We are confident, given the, what we know of the pipeline, that we will be able to uh, uh, bring uh, IW programming to the, to the level where it needs to be at this stage or the next stage of, of the replenishment cycle. Uh, but you know, I, I, I repeat this at every council meeting. It's very, it's much more complicated, much more time-consuming to put international waters projects together than it is to put a single country project for obvious reasons, and that's why it's always, uh, uh, it's typical that uh, uh, IW tries to catch up. And by the way, one of the questions yesterday on the IW results, one of the things that happened in Jeff's six cycle is be precisely because it takes more time for IW to, 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 to program, we were hit by the, the shortfall. And if we recall, we protected the star locations and there was a, a hit on the non-star uh, focal area so that, you know, uh, compressed the space that we had because it came later in the game. Um, the question of, uh, of uh, you want to address the question of uh, the role of, uh, of, the, of the executing it? Huh? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, yeah. so uh, you go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'm assigned to answer the one with the question. <laughs> uh, about uh, actually, does Stefan is still here? Okay, I see him. That then he will ask the question about uh, uh, what's the role of the, those uh, three entities in the sustainable cities or durable cities. And he also rightly mentioned that the city is a very crowded space and that's exactly the role of the GF. And actually, it's a very important question, so that's why I would like to really take it up. Um, uh, uh, by now, more than 10,000 cities have their own commitment and a strategy to cut emissions that then, so that they are quite a serious and, um, you know, group of cities really try to play a key role in it. But uh, um, the, this sustainable city program really try to help them do their job or to, to meet their own goal. Um, but how we can really best do it so that then uh, the best entities that who really knows that the, what are the needs, what are the strategies, where the support needs to go <coughs> is actually city-based institution. That that's why those C40 were well, equally really came to us to, you know, to, to, to seek our support. So that the, these are the ones who really knows the city-based needs, and that's why that then we would like to work with them. And uh, um, um, so all of that then, um, kind of 
global platform kind of thing look really same on paper, but this is really based on the quite serious dialogue with city leaders through those city-based institutions and with us and how we can best support uh, their, their uh, kind of goal. And when you, you see a lot of city-based projects, not all of them really have a strong focus of how to achieve the global environment, including not only actually GHG emission um, reduction, but also these days, how to address the resilience, how to address the, the um, uh, actually the uh, CSO mentioned that the people's right or that the uh, vulnerabilities, but also the nature. When we have seen that you know, those proposals coming from cities, one interesting um, evol evolution is that the proposal started to integrate nature-based solutions. It used to be more like a straightforward than um, GHG emission, but now it's really expanding to, uh, to the, the nature as a whole. So I think that we have a very good reason to work with them or to support their goal, and we try to be very selective to see that where we can be most strategic. And the best way to achieve that goal in that crowded space is, in my mind, or in our mind, to really work those in the city-based institution. That's why we have those three entities as an executing agencies, uh, but um, under the uh, leadership of the UNEP. But we also have a good conversation with other entities like uh, EBRD, the World Bank. They want to continue to to be a part of this and the support so that we will not lose that and what we have achieved in the past through the Jeff 6 um, But going forward, we want to catalyze those and the global knowledge uh, in that particular platform. So. I hope I answered to your question. Thank you. And uh, I think I have a, a, a couple of other questions that I didn't mention. I think this comes from Lauren about, uh, about uh, the secretariats of uh, conventions in terms of comments. Uh, secretariats of conventions are invited to submit comments uh, to, to, to the work program and to the, uh, any, any paper from the council. Uh, I must say that you know, we very rarely receive any any direct comments from the secretariats, uh, but we have another another way to, to to communicate and share information, which are the COP reports that we issued uh, for every for every convention, and they contain uh, every project that has been approved. It's under preparation, and if there is any questions uh, on that, uh, both from parties as well as from the secretariat through the secretariat, we're very happy happy to uh, address those. Uh, on the question of uh, you know what to do sometimes when there is a, a, a difference of opinion between agencies and the countries in regards to proposals, you know feel free to communicate with us. We can facilitate that process at times, and uh, and find you know, probably a, a, an easier solution to that to that construct uh, that uh, that would not delay too much uh, the process. And and at the end of the day, it is the choice of the countries to utilize one of the accredited agencies uh, uh, as, uh, to your choice. Um, I think I, I, I try to address all the questions. If there's any one that I didn't, happy to uh, address them now. Thank you. OK. So, um with um, this very fruitful and constructive and engaging discussion, I uh, would like to uh, seek your um, support, approval for this uh, uh, work program. Thank you so much. I just feel that we have a moment <laughs> of this council and I really, really appreciated it. So uh, the, we still do have some time so that then we want to go uh, on to the next program, which is uh, um, IEO. So it's now under you. Yes.
Okay, council members, can we can you take your seats, please? We need to continue our, our meeting. Um, I would like you to turn your attention to agenda item nine. Okay, so we are going to invite Yuha to, of the Jeff Independent Evaluation Office to take us through document 57 stroke 01 on agenda item nine. Yuha, please. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair, and um, good morning, barely. It's two minutes to noon. We're a few hours behind schedule, but, uh, but uh, we'll try to uh, keep your um, attention um, with this. Although Gustavo ended ended with the white bellbird, which was um, um, particularly noisy, noisy bird. We are not that noisy, but we we try to be uh, also as interesting as the as the uh, Amazonian dolphin that was uh, distinctly pink in Rosina's uh, uh, presentation last um, night. So uh, we have made a slight uh, uh, change in, in the way that we proceed. So, so in, the, in the past um, couple of years, we've been, um, we've been uh, having the SER, the uh, semi-annual report of the evaluation office as the uh, main uh, uh, document to be, uh, as the working, main working document. Uh, we have been uh, actually advised that, that that might actually somehow uh, give short shrift to some of the uh, major evaluations. So we have um, at this uh, stage decided that we will present the evaluations as working documents actually. So the semi-annual evaluation report uh, is um, basically seen as my uh, semi-annual uh, report on what the IEO has been up to. Uh, and what it is going to be up to uh, in the in the in the future, but then we will present separately the the two um, evaluations and studies that we have um, uh, done so far. Um, so let me just start by by the peer review uh, of the evaluation function, which is an important uh, thing that is going on. Uh, right now. I would like to uh, remind uh, the council, and there are some new council members here also, that these peer reviews are a, um, um, a, a good practice um, thing. There's always this uh, uh, question about uh, who evaluates the evaluators. So, so we have evaluators evaluating the evaluators. Um, uh, this time. In, in, in December last year, one year ago, um, uh, I proposed to the Council that there should be another um, uh, peer review of the evaluation function, or I suggested that there should be another review, and I gave the options to the Council whether, whether you would like to actually uh, commission an external review of the, of the um, evaluation function or, or you would um, entrust it with the evaluation office to actually to do to commission an, an uh, a peer review uh, you opted for the uh, latter option and and we acted on it we have a very high level uh, evaluation uh, peer review uh, panel which I think most of them would be here somewhere in the room, and some of you have already talked with them. Yes, I can see at the back of the room we have uh, uh, Saraswati Menon, who is the chair of the of the peer review uh, group, and 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 she is a long-term uh, chair of the of the UN evaluation group, and and used to be in the past also the director of the Independent Evaluation Office of UNDP. Uh, we have um, Michael Spilsbury, who is uh, um, the director of uh, evaluation at, uh, at uh, UN Environment or UNEP, um, a major partner to us, of course. Um, we have um, uh, uh, Marvin Taylor Dormant, 
uh, who is uh, the Director General of Evaluation in the Asian Development Bank, another uh, partner, where Marvin, I think, is not here today, or yet he's on his way. And, and we have Tullia Ayatsi, who is uh, uh, the uh, main uh, writer of the peer review and, and formerly of FAO uh, evaluation. So we have, a, we have a very high level panel here that is looking at, uh, at what uh, we have been up to. And the panel is at the same time um, also representing uh, the uh, evaluation cooperation group of the international financial institutions and the UN evaluation group. So we trust that they will uh, provide us very significant advice and, and they will be actually reporting to the council on their findings and, and recommendations to us in, in the June meeting. Um, they are a peer review group, but, but um, um, they are highly independent also. Okay, let me then uh, go into um, what we are up to. And, and maybe it's just that I'm getting old, but, um, but time seems to be flying uh, very fast. Uh, the OPS 6 uh, uh, was uh, presented to the Council in, in advance of the, of the uh, replenishment of the GEF, uh, and, and that's actually two years ago. And we congratulated ourselves very much for completing it on time and, and so forth. But, um, but um, lo and behold, uh, we have to be gearing up towards OPS 7 which has to be delivered to the, to the uh, Council and to the next replenishment process in just two years. So all of our work that we are currently doing um, um, relates to OPS 7. Um, later today, in, well, in about 15 minutes probably, we will be uh, presenting to you an evaluation of the uh, strategic cluster, country cluster evaluation of small island developing state SIDS. Um, you will probably remember that we started uh, three of these cluster, country cluster evaluations, and the SIDS ones is the first one to be delivered uh, today, but in June we will be delivering you to, the, uh, to, uh, to you the other two ones. One which is on, 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 on the Sudan, Sudan Sahelian um, uh, belt of um, uh, Africa, and the other one uh, is on least developed countries. There is a, a certain amount of overlap in these categories, um, but that's um, 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 actually intentional in, in, in this case. Um, these um, three categories of countries uh, are, were selected for the reason that, uh, that the Council was, has expressed quite a lot of interest in, 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 in them. And even today, even this morning, I have heard quite a lot of discussion about how does the GEF uh, relate to LDCs and, and, and SIDS. So we, uh, we want to uh, deliver uh, these evaluations to you uh, next time. The uh, very closely related to it is, is the evaluation of, uh, of the GEF engagement in fragile and conflict-affected uh, situations. I understand that this is, this is not a, a category that is uh, generally uh, used in, 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 in the GEF uh, parlance, and it's not a uh, not in an, an official category, but as uh, STAP was uh, presenting yesterday, I think, um, which is, uh, is that about 40% of the of the projects that the GEF deals with um, take place in in what can be categorized as uh, fragile or or uh, conflict affected or post conflict uh, uh, situations. So it is very important for us to understand whether how, how, how does uh, the GEF um, programming relate to uh, these kind of issues? How, how is the GEF dealing uh, with the contextual factors that relate to 
um, uh, to um, the country context, because as we know, um, we cannot um, separate environmental programming from from what is happening in in the country um, uh, in general. Um, other ways, we'll also be in, uh, presenting to you the the um, annual performance report uh, 2020 on which will have a specific theme relating to the update of the star uh, allocation system. We'll have others, um, 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 LDCF um, programmatic evaluation uh, last year you also, or earlier uh, this year you uh, approved um, in our work program that, um, that we should conduct uh, programmatic evaluations of L LDCF and SCCF and so forth. Um, uh, we'll be also bringing to you the approach paper of, of, um, of OPS7 for consideration so that you um, um, will be comfortable and you will be you'll you'll have the opportunity to to correct us if we if you think that we are omitting some very essential aspects of of, of OPS uh, seven, which is supposed to be a comprehensive evaluation. Again, and we will be proposing to you uh, a specific theme uh, for it. We have plans further on for uh, for December uh, 2020. Um, um, Council meeting and, and and beyond, but but at this stage, maybe I shouldn't go into that. But I, but I w I would just like to say the fact that um, uh, we will be pay paying particular attention, of course, to the uh, to the impact programs and and so forth. The thing is that um, um, the impact programs are relatively new still, so we we will may not be able to to give definite answers to to their impacts and and to the actual results of these programs but but at the same time uh, we will be able to um, uh, do more formative kinds of evaluations or real time uh, kind of evaluations about um, how the processes have gone whether they are on the right track the global platforms that are um, proposed to be um, some of the most in innovative and 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 uh, and, and uh, important um, aspects of value adding by these programs, we will be looking into into them. Now on OPS seven, so so we are planning on. Uh, on how how do we deliver uh, OPS seven and 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 the guidance is obviously um, based on on what happened last time around and if if the process remains more or less the se same as it was uh, in the previous replenishment negotiations um, the the schedule for us would be that we would be um, so. Um, approach paper next June, spring of uh, 2021 would be when, when uh, presumably there would be the first um, meeting of the, of the parties, of the replenishment parties, and, and we would aim at that point to present you an update on, on where, do, where we stand on, on, on the evaluations. You, some of you will remember that um, uh, in uh, last time around, in, uh, this was in March 2017, um, we were able to present to you briefs on most of the evaluations. They, they were not um, final, they were not um, uh, the definitive answer, but, but, they, but they gave you a fairly good flavor regarding um, the performance of the GEF in, in different areas. And then half a year later, um, we were able to present you, uh, to you the, the final draft report of the OPS7. And that, this is, if we follow the same scheme, 
So it would be about um, October 2021 when we would have a, a um, draft report of OPS 7, uh, which we would then discuss in the replenishment uh, context and, and present to the Council for final approval uh, in December 2021. So that's the, that's the general plan. So apart from that, so what we have been up to, so um, we obviously evaluations are the, are the core business of our, our work. But we have an, another category of uh, products which, um, uh, which we call knowledge products. But it's, it's quite important to uh, notice that these are not uh, um, uh, flimsy things. They are actually very much based on evaluative evidence. So the distinction when we say knowledge product and an evaluation is basically that the knowledge products uh, are mostly not um, um, developed uh, conducting primary research or, or uh, new evaluations in the field as we, as we do with the evaluations. These are more of a category of meta-analysis. So we use evaluative evidence from the past um, in, in, in developing these uh, knowledge products. And, um, but, but it's still rigorous, uh, and I, I say that this is still based on objective, um, evaluative analysis of, of what has happened. It's been interesting to hear um, yesterday and today that there's been a, a quite a lot of discussion about the um, international waters uh, program area, for example, and uh, it was um, in, co in the context of the annual monitoring report, but also uh, today um, regarding the work program and so so forth. So we have two knowledge products that are looking into this. Uh, one is one is regarding the fisheries, and the other one is um, regarding uh, freshwater portfolio. And uh, it has been pointed out by um, many council members that this freshwater po uh, portfolio is uh, a very important important, but it has been lagging behind, and it was in, in our OPS 7 International Waters Focal Area Evaluation where we pointed out also that it has somewhat fallen uh, wayside um, um, and uh, uh, lagging behind um, um, uh, the marine areas. But this, it continues to be very, very important. Um, we are also looking into the co-benefits of um, uh, uh, related to different focal areas, and we started a study uh, with uh, chemicals and waste where we uh, are looking at the health co-benefits because you know the co-benefits are quite important. Although if the if the uh, GEF objective remains on the global environmental side we still um, are generating quite a lot of co-benefits, co and we know that, uh, that um, if we, that, uh, that the uh, natural and human systems and the, and the environmental and social and economic benefits have to be somewhat um, aligned for us to be able to achieve our objectives. But there are also, um, both synergies and, and, and um, uh, trade-offs. We started doing um, country and constituency evaluation notes, and this started uh, in connection with the, with the assembly two years ago, um, where uh, we, in, in the assembly, at the assembly, we, we did a number of uh, constituency-based uh, consultations, and um, and um, uh, we prepared quite well for it and, and tried to look very systematically at what has happened in that um, particular constituency and particular countries in terms of GEF programming and results. Now, uh, we have continued with this, and, and, and I think that this is becoming a stream of work that we have. We have done a few um, 
country notes on um, Mexico and Peru, for example, that were the first two ones, and we are going to continue on, on this so that uh, we are able to inform countries also uh, of how GEF is helping them or where there could be improvements. And this is a feature that we are doing in the, in the context of the extended um, constituency workshops also. Okay, then a little bit of um, um, good news from, at least from our own point of view, uh, which is that we did a, um, another stakeholder engagement survey. We did one uh, in 2015 um, where we um, asked our stakeholders, different stakeholder groups, um, uh, you know, how, how they uh, perceived the, pro uh, the products that we are making and, and, and what could be improved. We got a lot of um, uh, constructive comments um, and which we have responded to in, in uh, many ways, including the um, constituency and the country notes actually was something that was uh, uh, in, in, uh, suggested by the stakeholders four years ago. And, and also the learning briefs uh, that um, we found that were quite um, uh, useful, or, or the stakeholders found that were quite useful and we're continuing to them now. So we we start we decided to do another stakeholder survey uh, uh, this year, uh, basically to obtain feedback again on the quality and the use of, of IEO evaluations and, and our other other products, and to see how we could improve on this. This is also um, an additional objective: is the fact that we do have this peer review uh, that is um, uh, zooming on on our utility and our usefulness and our relevance. So we wanted to get some data really from the stakeholders of, uh, of um, you know, whether, whether we are doing well. We got an amazing um, rate of responses, 1,114 uh, responses um, of which uh, about 70 percent, almost 70 percent, was from uh, from within the GEF partnership, including the agency, CSOs, uh, operational focal points, poli political focal points, uh, secretariat staff, and conventions, and so on. Um, the um, you as council members, um, you got. Um, um, the request to, to respond to this, and, and we got um, um, actually 37 council um, affiliated persons who responded. You might ask that you know that there's not even 37 members in the council, so how is this possible? But the, the point is that, uh, that uh, uh, we sent it to everybody. We sent it to uh, the council members, alternates, alternates and, and, and others in the delegation. So that was uh, quite a wonderful um, response rate. And even more wonderful, at least from my point of view, is that, uh, that there has been, a, that the, the survey uh, responded uh, very positively uh, with regard uh, to our um, uh, evaluations. So there was um, over 90% satisfaction rate when it comes to the quality, relevance, transparency, clarity, um, and, and so forth of our evaluations. Um, and 80% of the respondents um, said that they, they are actually using our evaluations. And please re remember that the 80% also includes um, people who are not directly participants in the GEF because we sent this survey to to others also, um, um, civil society organizations, other agencies, uh, academia, and so forth. Um, we sent it to 10,000 people or something like that. So, uh, so you have a quite high use ratio here. 
um, where actually participants were saying that they use our evaluations for designing programs and, and for uh, designing policies and, 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 uh, and, and informing their decision making. That was quite good. Same, um, the relevance of our evaluations was um, seen as, uh, as mostly relevant and of course the comprehensive evaluation uh, most so. Dissemination channels, and this, is, this comes back to uh, what I was saying again, uh, earlier, that we will continue um, uh, producing the four-page notes, uh, which were actually, according to the stakeholder survey, uh, found to be the, the most useful, the most uh, um, easily um, accessible uh, way of us uh, of our uh, disseminating our our findings. It's all all pretty good, but but I can see that we, we may have some work to do on on social media, for example, and 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 how do we and we are strengthening our website uh, constantly and 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 trying to uh, work on channels such as um, Twitter and. Um, Instagram and so forth uh, um, to get our message out out there. Here are just some of the uh, some of the suggestions, the concrete suggestions that the stakeholders um, presented to us uh, with regard uh, products and dissemination and 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 the website and 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 we are taking these into account. It's like. In 2015, we responded quite um, actively, proactively, I should say, uh, to the proposals, and we are taking this seriously, and, and, and we will be doing this. We also did the third international conference on evaluating environment and de development. Um, why third? Um, well simply because there was the first and the second before that. And the first was um, done actually in, in 2008 in Alexandria in Egypt, and it was the um, first of its kind where um, evaluate, evaluators came together to actually systematically discuss how do we know that um, um, evaluation is contributing to um, environmental and climate uh, issues. Um, in 2014, just when I joined, um, uh, there was the second conference and it was a bit of a windfall for me because I was a new person and I hadn't been very much involved in it, but my predecessor of Vandenberg had, had been driving this and, and, and we were able to put together um, uh, a major conference in, here in DC on, on the topic. I have to say that this is quite remarkable, uh, that um, we produced a book based on, on that, that conference. Uh, we, we subsidized the publication so that um, a major um, international publisher, Springer Verlag, um, published it as an open access book. So, so it's free, uh, free um, uh, public goods. And I just went a couple of days ago and, and looked at the, at the uh, downloading statistics. It has been downloaded, be ready for this, 148,097 times. That's quite, quite remarkable. It's, uh, there are not 148,000 evaluators uh, in this world, I hope. Um, so it, it, it kind of shows that the, that the product has reached out far beyond the evaluation com uh, community. It has, uh, uh, you know, struck a note with uh, the broader environment and, and, and climate uh, community. And, and, um, and it also means that there is a, a concrete demand for this kind of information uh, in the world. So, um, we, uh, we did this uh, conference now 
in October in, in uh, Prague in Czech Republic. Uh, we chose the place, not we didn't cho choose the place because we, we chose to join hands with the International Development Evaluation Association ideas that had its uh, global assembly in Prague. So therefore we, we were also, also able to, um, uh, to, to um, synergize with the broader evaluation community and we got very high level participation uh, of um, hundreds of people in, into this conference and we are actually planning on on, on doing another bestseller, which we hope will be a bestseller again on, 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 on this one. Apart from that, we continue our knowledge management and dissemination activities. We are parts of the ECG, the Evaluation Cooperation Group of the, of the, of the Multilateral Development um, Finance Institutions. Uh, we are part of the UN Evaluation Group uh, we have been, we, we did a, um, a dissemination um, uh, effort at the, at the CCD COP in, in September, and we've been participating in, in different areas. We have also been asked by the organizers of SHIP, that the Shanghai International Development Program for Development Evaluation Training to, to um, develop a course, a workshop on environmental evaluation or evaluating at the nexus of environment and, and, and development. And, and we piloted this um, last month um, in Shanghai and we had a, a quite, uh, we had a government, uh, the trainees were government officials for about uh, 15 Asian countries ranging from Afghanistan to, to East Asia and to Southeast Asia and, and so on. So, so it was quite useful. Okay, that's, that's, that's the SER. That's the uh, semi-annual report. And then I would like to move to the two remaining items that we have. One, one is... Um, on a methodological approach to post completion evaluation, and then finally uh, the uh, cluster, country cluster evaluation on, on seeds that I will ask uh, Gita to present. So, in June, uh, in the June Council, the council, uh, council members asked us, and, 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 and it was recorded in the, in the minutes that, uh, that the um, Evaluation office should pay more attention to evaluating um, the the, uh, the you know uh, the projects at post completion stage, and um, and this obviously has been a major issue also in this uh, in this council meeting. And yesterday we had a discussion on the durability um, of 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 GEF programming. And, and so, so we, are, we took this, again, we took this uh, request from the council quite seriously and, and we started thinking about how can we do this. Um, it's, a, it, it's actually a kind of a um, holy grail for, for many evaluators is this thing that, you know, how, uh, yeah, how do you go beyond uh, project completion? How do you go um, past uh, you know, to find out whether something was actually left behind. And we are in a lucky position that we are an independent evaluation office, office uh, so, so we have the mandate and the resources to actually, actually do this. So we started developing a method. We started developing an approach uh, to this. Uh, how do we um, uh, analyze both um, the extent to which outcomes that were achieved uh, by projects, um, they, to what extent do they continue beyond project completion? And, and also then understanding what are um, the conditions that allow them to continue or, or not. So the things that we are 
thus trying to measure in this, in this new evaluation approach is both the outcomes and their continuity, but also the influencing factors, um, what, are, what are the ones that uh, um, either uh, promote or hinder the continuation of, of benefits. So then we also started thinking about how do we select uh, projects, because um, it is still a, uh, our resources are not unlimited and, and time is not unlimited, or how do we, how do we select uh, uh, the projects that we will, would be looking at. And, and our, um, these are the three major criteria that we are proposing at this stage. One is that, the, that it would be at least uh, four or five years after, the, after a project has been com uh, completed uh, before we go there and, and try to see what's happening. You may, some of you may, might uh, uh, remember that a couple of years ago, as part of OPS 7, uh, we did uh, an evaluation of the GEF land degradation portfolio, which, in which we were actually able to show that it takes an average four to five years after project completion before you start actually seeing solid environmental results on the ground. And I emphasize the word environmental because, you know, it's been, you, you can see what the project has done and, and there are lots of important steps in between legislative, regulatory reforms and so forth. But uh, the environment that, that you actually have measurable environmental results, it, it takes uh, quite a long time. And we also want to, want to do uh, these evaluations so that they can contribute to um, other evaluative uh, processes and, and larger questions. So then we pioneered um, uh, this um, approach in looking at the Yellow Sea um, portfolio. And we, we started, we, we wanted to also to see how much field work do you have to do and how much can you actually glean uh, from, uh, for example, using geospatial analysis, which is, uh, you know, using remote sensing images and time series uh, images, which is, which is extremely useful when, when, when you actually want to um, see a, um, uh, an objective picture of, of what has happened on the ground to the in environment. And, and the fact that using geospatial images is, uh, you know, allows us to actually go back in ta time because uh, you can uh, get access to imagery that is um, 20 years old, for example, which, is, which allows us to see what's happening. So we looked at the, at the Yellow Sea uh, large marine ecosystem where GEF has had uh, uh, eight projects um, over the past uh, two decades or so, so <coughs> forth. And, 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 and all of these projects have had the uh, same co goal of reducing marine pollution. So we looked at, if you click once more, you can see the um, um, well, the chlorophyll um, concentration in 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 this um, in this uh, ecosystem, and 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 the chlorophyll uh, concentration is actually a good good um, indicator of of um, organic pollution. In, in, into the waters, and, and you, you can see that it's coming from uh, mostly non-point sources, from agriculture, from urban centers in the coastal areas, and 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 you can you can see actually that it has uh, uh, been spreading from the coast to the main part of the part of the sea over these periods. We looked at um, uh, the chlorophyll. Over time, at, at different, uh, in different ways, in different different parts of the sea, and we tied it uh, or correlated it 
uh, with, the, with the projects. Here are five projects, um, GEF projects that are listed here, uh, a time series in, in the, in, in below. There are three newer ones, but they have not been completed yet, so, or, or they don't fit into this uh, category that they should have been completed at least five years before. So we didn't include them in the analysis, but, but there is. Uh, and you can s see here again, um, there's, a t there's always a time lag like I said about the land degradation project. So it takes, takes a while, you know, things get worse before they get better. Uh, but you can see that there is now a demonstrated uh, decrease in the chlorophyll, uh, chlorophyll uh, pollution. And um, the, so this was the geospatial analysis we did uh, using, the, using the satellite data and so on. But we also understood that this is um, not adequate. We have to have to resort to more um, traditional evaluation methodologies and so forth. And, and so, so we we did interviews with the uh, project and other stakeholders, uh, including the operational focal points in in these countries, to better understand what else has happened during these times. So, so you cannot attribute everything to the GEF, obviously. So you have to see the GEF in a, in a broader um, uh, context. So in a, in a way, so conclusion is that the geospatial analysis is actually very um, useful in the sense that you, you can actually uh, track environmental impacts on the ground and you can track what has actually happened, what are the changes in, in the physical environment. Uh, at the same time, um, correlation is not attribution and, 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 and we, have to, we have to be able to understand um, in a more qualitative manner what has happened, uh, why uh, how, how has the GEF played into, into this thing? So therefore, it is very important to, uh, to use uh, mixed methods. And, and, and we hope that we will have a, this is, I don't think you can read it, but this is basically the template that we have developed for this post-completion uh, evaluations. And, and we aim to use it, uh, use the approach quite systematically um, in, in uh, looking at um, projects um, that um, meet the criteria where you can look at, you know, that they were completed uh, four or five years before, they, they, uh, they contribute to some larger questions and so forth. So for OPS 7, I believe that we can, we can more or less um, uh, present perhaps 25, realistically, 25 new post-completion uh, evaluation verification uh, cases to, uh, to you and, and see what are the lessons uh, from, from this. So with this, um, I would like to then uh, pass it on to my, uh, yeah, or how do we do? Yes. Okay, so we need to have, have two different sessions that we need to, so that we still in before we go into the cluster discussion. Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, you, 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 ha. Huh? There are two agenda items that um, were presented just now, agenda item number nine and agenda item number 11. And there are two separate decisions, really, these two agenda items. But before we go into the, the one on the strategic um, country cluster evaluation for SIDS, could we open the floor for questions on agenda items number nine first? and agenda item number 11. So the floor is now open for questions on agenda item number nine. Marita, please. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to address uh, both uh, items, if, if that's okay. Um, on the first, on the nine, we th thank you for a um, very interesting uh, report and highly relevant evaluations. Um, I think I, I would like to focus on the, uh, the second point on uh, um, um, uh, the agenda point number 11. Uh, on post-completion verification. Um, we find the, the proposed approach very interesting um, and its potential application, but we note that there are limitations. So we have two specific questions, if you can elaborate on the weaknesses of this um, method and also on the cost benefit of, of doing it, because it's, it seems very exciting, but there must also be implications on cost. Um, and also, I, I would also appreciate if you can um, estimate how, to what extent you would use that methodology. Thank you. Thank you, Marita. Next on the list is Aparna, and followed by Comlan. Aparna, please. So, um, thank you. I just um, wanted to um, record my appreciation for the work that is going on in the Independent Evaluation Office and uh, draw on my, on my, um, for my rep uh, remarks on the uh, semi-annual uh, report, the peer review, right? So I, I went through the peer review with great, uh, great interest. And para 16 of the peer review was very, report was very telling for me. So uh, I will just draw attention of the council also to that paragraph 16, which basically says that the evaluation reports are used uh, most by the staff and they have used it for OP, uh, OPS6 uh, has been used extensively for Jeff. It is being used for, um, uh, you know, new projects, et cetera. But they also record lowest satisfaction. For me, this is uh, a concern. It is worrisome. I would uh, like Jeff's secretariat and CEO to try to work on how we can ensure that the excellent evaluation out, outputs that we have contribute to institutional learning. I think that will be a very valuable, um, uh, valuable um, improvement in uh, the way we, the different um, institutions within Jeff uh, work with each other. So that was the single point that I wanted to make on the uh, first agenda. On 14, that is the post-completion evaluation, I am uh, very excited by the uh, paper that you have presented and the approach that uh, is uh, proposed in that paper, because I have also been grappling with this uh, fact that now interventions are becoming more and more complex. There are more players. Jeff is often a small or a, a, a single intervention in a series of interventions to at address a particular problem. So the problem of attribution of Jeff's intervention to the overall environmental outcomes is an interesting uh, issue for study as far as I'm concerned. And I'm really happy that you are looking at different factors that contribute to the progress of outcomes even after the Jeff project is completed. In particular, I, um, I will be very interested in how you will use technology second. I mean, because you have said that technology cannot be used in all cases, but wherever you use it, we are extremely uh, supportive of the use of technology. Second thing which I will be very interested in is you have identified that you will also look at unintended consequences. That is, again, really very, uh, very uh, something that we welcome. And the third thing that I would like post-completion certification studies can give us value is you're looking at the enabling environment and the factors. Perhaps if you could focus on how the country governments and the local communities have added resources to achieve the continued outcomes, the progress on the continued outcomes. It will again be a good lesson for us, how we are able to leverage a Jeff project to achieve a nationwide programmatic impact. I think that we have seen it in sustainable cities. We hope to see it under 
Dr. Folur. So this is a, a lesson that we could draw from the post-completion verification. And thank you very much for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. Next on the list is Kamland, followed by Lauren. Merci, merci au bureau de Thank you to the independent office for the quality of uh, uh, data. Uh, I will talk about the point 11 on the uh, post-completion verification. I would like to uh, go back to what was said earlier on the cost. The question on the cost that that might bring about for the implementation of this evaluation, what are the tools that will be used? Uh, you talked about uh, geospatial data. Do we have an idea as to how much that might cost us for this uh, evaluation, for post completion verification? Among the criteria uh, for selecting projects uh, to be evaluated, you talked about the age of projects that will be evaluated. We did see that uh, it was four to five years completed. This would be the minimum. Is there a maximum age beyond which a project might not be evaluated? So could you give us more ideas on this? Thank you. Thank you, Kamla. Lauren, please. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank the IEO um, for their report, um, and we're very happy to see the positive results of the survey. Uh, our intervention will focus on agenda item number 11. As you probably know, this is an, a subject that we are very interested in, and this is something that we had suggested at the last uh, council meeting. Um, and we see it also very much linked to the issue of sustainability and durability, as you mentioned as well, that we discussed yesterday. Uh, we have some, some comments on the methodology. Um, we would like to know who is supposed to be using uh, this methodological approach. Is it the Jeff Partner Agencies and the IEO um, or the IEO? And how will the reports especially be used? Will they be presented to the Council? Will they be shared in the Jeff Partnership? I think there will be a lot of important lessons learned that would be very useful for the agencies when they're designing new projects. Um, in terms of measuring key social impacts, will gender-related impacts also be measured? Um, and we're also wondering, you will be identifying factors that lead to more durability of projects, but will you also be identifying um, factors that lead to non-durability, that are not enabling the projects to, to last after the duration of the, the support? I think that would also be interesting. And finally, we would like to suggest to go back and look at the methodological approach after some years and see if it needs to be revised based on the experience made. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lauren. Next on the list is Cordula, followed by Anna. Well, thank you to the I.O. for the interesting presentation. I will also focus on uh, number 11. We welcome the new approach on post-completion evaluations, and they allow us to assess the durability and sustainability of JEF interventions and to draw relevant conclusions for future project design and implementation. For a better understanding, we would uh, like to ask to define the terms ex-post verification and ex-post evaluation, as the difference between these concepts with regards to the methodology is currently still unclear. We welcome the proposed methodology, including, where appropriate, the utilization of satellite imaginary, which can help both in terms of timeliness and cost efficiency, but well, therefore we, we were also interested in the question about the price uh, in cases where environmental indicators can be assessed remotely. We would still like to understand how transformational change will actually be measured and verified. The methodology currently allows the answers yes, in process, and no, and unable to assess. This should be underpinned with objective criteria and indicators in order to determine whether projects actually achieve transformational change. We would also like to stress the need to plan for, for post-completion evaluations as early as possible in the project design process. This is especially relevant to define relevant baselines and to inform the theory of change and monitoring system for those indicators and objectives that cannot be obtained via satellite imagery. 
If possible, synergies between GEF interventions pursuing similar objectives in the same region should be taken into account in planning the evaluations. Thank you. Thank you, Cordulo. Anar, please, followed by Yoshi Tomo. Thank you. Thank you very much to the IEO for this report and the presentation. Um, Canada is pleased to see that the IEO has a number of important and informative evaluations uh, planned to be shared with the Council in 2020. We are particularly interested in the work uh, on the GEF's engagement in fragile and conflict-affected situations, given that the relationship between environmental programming and security is an increasingly important factor that is impacting the achievement of results on the ground. Uh, with respect to the post-completion uh, evaluation, we are very supportive of the, uh, the approach that is being proposed, and we are keen to follow the progress being made to ensure that the lessons that will be learned from these evaluations are actually uh, influencing programming. Having said that, we also support the calls for, um, for more detailed analysis on the cost uh, that these evaluations would... Uh, would be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anar, Ashitomo, followed by Graciela. Uh, thank you, Co-Chair, and uh, uh, good morning, colleagues, um, or maybe good afternoon. Um, uh, we would like to uh, uh, comment on Agenda Item 11, uh, which is a post-completion verification. Um, uh, firstly, we would like to thank the IEO for the uh, very interesting presentation. Um, in general, uh, we think a comprehensive analysis employing uh, both qualitative and quantitative data accessible uh, at the time is critical for project evaluation. And uh, from this viewpoint, uh, we welcome the appropriate and effective introduction of the methodology based on remote sensing technologies to bring in additional information for evaluating Jeff's work program uh, with considerations given to the characteristics of the technologies as discussed in the paper. Um, additionally, uh, as referred, in the, referred to in the document, uh, uh, the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA, uh, has long taken the approach of verifying uh, the outputs of each project, focusing on achieving effectiveness and sustainability of impact of projects. Um, JICA projects have therefore generally yielded satisfactory measurable results based on scientific data. So we will be happy to assist the Secretariat in further sharing some of the best practices and information from this approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next on the list, Graciela, followed by Dana. Muchas gracias. In the Southern Cone uh, uh, group, we thank you for the report. We see uh, with great pleasure the work done by the IEO. We have several questions, um, and what we would like to know we would like to have a workshop uh, for all of us about uh, the evaluation process, the new technologies that will be used. So maybe we could have a workshop on evaluation only uh, for the Southern Cone um, a group. In terms of the post-completion evaluation, we're very happy with the process. We like it. And once that we look at the cost-benefit analysis, we would like to go beyond and see how much CO2 has been captured, for example, in the plantations and projects five, ten years ago, and they were not measured because the project ended. This would be a good opportunity to see how much has been captured by the countries with the projects that we undertook. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Dan, followed by Rob. Merci. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. May I, on behalf of my group, thank, thank the 
important work that was accomplished. We do same thing with the staff. We appreciate work being done by both departments. We appreciate diversification, uh, spatial and topical. And uh, we think that the products of this work should be used, as Aparna said, should be used within Jeff, but also in our countries. And we truly appreciate the post-completion verification, and we think that it should be continued. Jeff, shall I remind you, is one of the initiatives that we care for in our sub-region, and the initiative as to the Niger Basin, Lake Chad, and others, all these initiatives, we should know what is the impact that they've had. And that's what we expect, and we would like to see more of this work. But we also think we should find how all these products could be integrated in our countries for learning more. In the future, Niger, you might know, has a very important initiative for the African region, which is the investment for climate in Sahel, for Sahel countries. This was developed, and it is being, it, it is going to raise 140 billion C francs CFA, and this is based uh, on the implementation of national plans, so we have all our priorities, and we think that we should, at some time, that the independent office have a zooming effect on these projects so that we might be inspired with your work. We will build ourselves or base ourselves on the experience of Jeff. We have a lot of action in the field. And as you know, we might have some difficulties having the resources. We would like to have more light. And we think that this evaluation should be a reference for all these processes in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Next, Rob. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, IEO, for that very interesting um, and, and important report. We are very appreciative of, of the IEO's work and consider this evidence-based approach to evaluating the different elements of the Jeff portfolios, past, present, and future, as one of the cornerstones of Jeff's success. We also welcome the methodological approach for post-completion verification. We think this approach is an exciting, useful, and cost-effective contribution to the IEO's evaluation work, and we look forward to its application. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. CSO next, followed by Victoria. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. On behalf of the CSO ne Network, we'd like to comment on the item number nine. The report highlights that there's still quite a bit of work to be done before the submission in June 2020. There is a concern that there may be a challenge in completing this work. Further, we would recommend that the GF Council allocate adequate resources to complete as, as uh, submitted. In regards to the peer review, we support the recommendation for an external peer review, and this should be undertaken um, and appointed by the Trust in the interests of impartiality, good governance, and transparency. 
This should be independent of the IAO review and should only be done after the June submission. It is mentioned that further evaluations uh, will be done on the four to five years um, principle, which we support. We would recommend, though, that to conduct annual reviews leading up to the five-year evaluation so that lessons can be learnt and implemented on the way, setting the trends. Without the document, throughout the document, it is observed that most common challenges are land degradation, climate change, and biodiversity loss, driven by pressing social economic needs of the rapidly growing populations around the world. We recommend that these issues should be further explored when dealing with all projects of GEF. Lastly, innovation and risk management is fundamental to GEF actions and are highlighted in the report, but are not being incorporated as fully as GEF would like. We therefore recommend that GEF puts into place a mechanism to implement these recommended actions. Thank you. We would also appreciate a copy of the PowerPoint, which is extremely educational. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next on the list, Victoria, followed by Stefan. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to thank the, the Independent Evaluation Office for the semi-annual evaluation report and also the methodological, methodological approach to post-completion verification, especially the latter document is of uh, great interest to us um, and it it's, sounds very promising to reach greater durability of CHEF projects. Similar to what others have mentioned already, uh, we'd be interested to hear a bit more about how the approach will be implemented in the future in a, in a systematic manner. I'm very pleased to hear as well that OPS 7 um, might have 25 cases, as you mentioned, of post-completion verification cases. If you already know how you will identify those cases, that would be interesting to hear as well. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Stefan, please. Thank you, Co-Chair. Um, we join those that um, expressed their appreciation for the presentation and for the report. Um, always welcome uh, five points um, and thank you for the timeline for uh, OP7 it's always a tight timeline uh, so the uh, call by the CSO of uh, sufficient resources and good wishes from all of us um, are also supported from our side it's a crucial ingredient for a for a uh, uh, how would I put it uh, uh, well-informed uh, replenishment process. Uh, on the remote sensing, um, it's, it's a good tool to use because um, it's factual. It doesn't cost as much as it used to in the old days. Uh, you have timelines, but it does not capture gender or social co-benefits. So I think the, the cost element is actually more on those sides that we do not want to see neglected when it comes to uh, these kind of operations. Uh, on the institutional uh, learning, I join others that say it's critical. Um, good to hear that the JEFSEC makes a lot of uh, use of these evaluations, but we hope that agencies and, and uh, um, focal points in the countries also look at them. Good to hear that you're involved in these international associations and that you get 140,000 downloads. Hope they all read the thing and didn't just download it and print it. Uh, attribution, uh, Aparna uh, referred to that explicitly. As there's several players, and the Jeff also plays with others uh, uh, in, in, in that sphere that is uh, luckily getting more crowded because more actors are working towards uh, uh, enhancing and, and preserving the global environment. Attribution is critical. We don't want to hear um, all the successes, it was the Jeff and the failures were the others. So I, I believe this methodologically some tricky things that we look forward to hear how you want to go about it. And um, finally, um, Thorough evaluation, uh, uh, and, and especially when you look at durability and sustainability, require time. 
but at the same time, in a fast-moving world, it's it's helpful to have some initial shots. Are we are we going on the right direction? And if I got you right, uh, um, Yuha, you mentioned something like a, a, um, something more of an informative nature uh, early on in processes, and and those are very welcome because uh, we. We can't wait until we have the uh, post-completion finalization uh, uh, evaluations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Next on the list is Renato, followed by Aparna. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. I'll make my intervention in Spanish. Our constituency of Brazil, Ecuador, and Colombia is thankful for the methodology, and we believe this should be included with interviews locally that benefited from the project in order to know whether they're satisfied and their current viewpoint. We are still having some questions, like, who would be responsible in order to do the verification? Or how will a budget be set up for this? In some projects in our region, and according its nature, it would be necessary to have more than one post-verification at five or 10 years, such as projects for recovering uh, lands or, or, or reforestation. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. Aparna, please. And <laughs> Thea will be the last speaker on our list. Aparna, please. I'm coming back just to correct myself. I referred to para 16 of peer review. It's actually stakeholder engagement survey results. So please, excuse me, put it down to old age, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. Correction noted. Um, Thea, please. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Um, and I'd first of all like to introduce myself to everybody as Thea Edwards, the new alternate council member for the UK. Is this on? Yeah. Right. Um, thank you very much to the IEO for these two very useful and very welcome papers. Um, I'd like to make a couple of comments, starting with the semi-annual evaluation review. Um, and I'd, I'd like to note that we really welcome the increased attention that the Jeff is giving uh, through the series of evaluations to cross-cutting issues, including gender mainstreaming, resilience and, fr and fragility, and private sector engagement, um, and of course the financing in the project design. We know that there are a number of studies and evaluations ongoing concurrently, but also that there are a number of clear and pertinent points of read across between them. For instance, um, through the application of, of things like risk, um, gender, innovation, conflict, etc. So we we're just wondering how much information do we have about how evaluations are applied and used in future project development and assessment? Is this information we subsequently receive as the council? And has there been consideration of how these evaluations, when finalised, can be integrated and applied to future project development and assessment? Moving on then to the post-completion evaluation uh, methodology. Uh, we agree that the long-term environmental results require uh, this form of post-completion uh, monitoring and that achieving the expected results at the end of the project is good but not re representative of the full picture. We agree with colleagues who have uh, mentioned that this is an important way to support greater understanding of the durability of GEF projects. Uh, we note that the satellite imagery um, proposed is both cutting edge and are particularly useful for geospatial analyses on forest use and forest and land use related projects. We also note that this will produce time series data and wonder if it would be possible for donors to have access to this data or if the GEF can create uh, some form of public data tool. Uh, we would like to understand further how projects will be selected for post-evaluation verification and the proportion of completed projects subject to this analysis. We suggest that the IEO should look at a diverse range of projects, including by geography, intervention type and risk profile. And finally, um, just to reflect the point my German colleague has made, um, there's a clear, a clear exposition of the indicators to be measured would be welcome, for instance, a cross-reference to the Jeff Core indicators. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. 
Um, I think we've had a, a, a fulsome um, set of questions and comments, so I'll ask Yuha if you could start with responding to some of these uh, queries. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, and, and, and thanks to the Council for the usual support uh, to our work. It's, it's, it's very much appreciated. It's, it's really uh, one thing that gets, keeps us going is the fact that, uh, that we do uh, receive this uh, positive feedback from the Council that the work that we are doing is, uh, uh, is useful. The, uh, well, uh, I guess the, I guess this, um, you know there are there are two uh, two kinds of pressures on our our work, and one one is the fact that you know that there is a lot of uh, demand, as as I have heard right now, uh, for post completion verification or post completion evaluation, and and knowing that the uh, whether the GEF projects are sustainable or durable. Uh, in their impacts. At the same time, there is this pressure of, 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 uh, of providing timely, timely information and, and more real-time um, information. And both of, both of these are factors that, uh, that we are talking about quite a lot in the office, and we are actually uh, trying to respond to both. Um, uh, and, and, and this uh, requires us to, at some level, to um, Change our approaches. Uh, we we cannot just uh, do what we have been doing in the in the past of of, of evaluating uh, completed uh, programs um, as they are. So so this is this is working working uh, progress. Um, on the uh, po and, and and maybe maybe I should say that that relates obviously to the use of the of the evaluations, and, and there were a couple of uh, comments made regarding, regarding the use of evaluations. And, and um, maybe Aparna's point about um, uh, the Jeff uh, Secretariat and Jeff Partners uh, using um, uh, most are the, uh, being the primary users of our, our evaluations, but, uh, but uh, um, being the least satisfied with them. Um, that's, uh, you know, I, I could be flippant and say 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 that it's it's uh, understandable in the sense because because they are the evaluant in the in the first place. So, so, um, but it has also to do with the fact that um, we always get this comment that you know we have been evaluating the past, which we actually do, of course, which means we in our current evaluations we are pay more attention to formative aspects of what has happened in the in the latest programming even if we are not able to go to the field and see see what the what the final uh, results are so we have to find a, ba a right balance in 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 uh, in uh, verifying what is verifiable and attributing what is attributable um, and, and at the same time, you know, uh, evaluating what is going on at this very moment, and how how does how do the processes, how do the uh, steps that are being taken reflect uh, evaluative findings, and how do they reflect what is uh, um, the current knowledge of of things? Because knowledge is constantly advancing. I. Um, there were uh, good questions about the uh, and good comments about the post post verification um, evaluation and and one of one of them was uh, uh, regarding Cordula's question about the um, uh, terminology and and we've been actually slightly um, confused about it ourselves. Um, uh, even the council decision uh, last year, I think, referred to both to post-completion verification and post-completion evaluation. My inclination would be uh, to go with post-completion evaluation for the reason that the post-completion verification is a more narrow uh, definition. It, 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 it would refer to that we go to verify something um, that was there before, for example, a terminal evaluation. But that's not what we are 
going to do because we are going to evaluate whether uh, there are lasting results on the ground. And for example, in this uh, yellow sea ex uh, example that we were testing, so we were not um, relating it to um, eight uh, project terminal evaluations. We, went, we, went, we were looking at what did the eight or five um, older projects amount to in the field. The cost of this um, uh, thing is um, really, uh, it has been observed by, uh, by uh, council members. Stefan uh, mentioned the fact that the cost of the uh, satellite imagery has gone down uh, significantly and most of, most of um, that kind of data we can actually use is, um, is actually free of charge or very low cost and, and, and we can, um, we have been partnering with local universities, for example, where, uh, where um, we have uh, faculties and, and graduate students who can actually, who we don't have that um, um, computing power in our office. We have some capacity. We have a couple of people who are top-notch PhDs in, in using this kind of a thing, so they can uh, design how we evaluate how we use this data, but, but then we can go to a university and ask them to do actually this research, and which is a mutually beneficial relationship because then um, uh, graduate students can use this uh, real, real life data for their um, theses and so forth. But, the, but it's also right that um, the satellite imagery cannot tell us all the gender uh, impacts, the social and economic impacts, and it doesn't, uh, doesn't tell us either uh, always why something has happened. So, so we, we do need to um, uh, do, uh, do that in the field, and that is, as has been pointed out, that is the expensive part. Which brings us to the selection of the projects for for uh, post-completion, and, and, and I said that there are these three criteria, and they, they relate to the uh, time frame, but it also relate to how these projects that we select for post-completion evaluation can inform, um, on the one hand, um, the larger issues that the GEF is dealing with, and on the other hand, um, the thematic evaluations that we are um, uh, conducting. So that's basically how, how we have to do it. And I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to hear that um, we have uh, not only the best wishes of the council, but also uh, support that um, um, we have to have the uh, right resources to do this. It's a, uh, there are certain limitations. We, we will not be able to do more than maybe 20 or 25 projects for the OPS uh, uh, 6 seven, sorry. Um, at the same time, um, we have a, um, a council-approved budget for this, uh, for this um, um, uh, four-year period, for the replenishment period, and, and at this stage we are not planning on coming to ask for more, actually. Um, so it would be within the envelope that we have because we want to tie these post-completion evaluations to, to uh, our regular uh, work program and, and the thematic uh, um, things. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, so um, Gita can uh, complement my um, So there was a big discussion on, on costs. Um, we hope not to incur a major cost in this exercise because this will be carried out as part of our thematic evaluation work that we undertake anyway. A lot of agencies, including the multilateral banks, et cetera, do carry out post-completion verification. What we found is there's no consistent approach to this. So what we're hoping to do is, if the council gives us the green signal, that we will actually work with the agencies to implement this in a consistent fashion, even when they carry out their post-completion verification. Um, in terms of collecting information on gender, et cetera, there's a lot of data collected by, for example, 
the World Bank on the longitudinal household survey data. We've actually used that in the context of Uganda and tried to marry that with Jeff data. So we will try and piggyback as much as possible on existing data sources. Field verification will be as part of our thematic evaluations that we travel to countries to. Uh, technology, as you have pointed out, we've invested in, in people as well as we use a lot of, try and use a lot of free resources in this area. There's a lot of free data now available. Um, who's using this was one question raised by Norway. Uh, it's being used by several agencies right now. Um, we'll try and make it more consistent. Um, but the thing is that most of them don't look a lot at, especially the MDBs are not focused as much on the environmental outcomes. They're more focused on the development outcomes. So that's where we have to uh, make the push. Um, Non-durability. Um, yes, we've started looking at this in the context of the strategic country clusters and our presentation on the small island developing states. I'm trying to make a pitch for it after lunch. Uh, we'll focus a little bit on that. In terms of measurement of transformational change that was raised by Germany, we developed a framework and presented it to the council a few sessions ago. Uh, we have subsequently actually gone to the different agencies, made presentations. We've started applying that in the context of all our evaluations, and we hope that agencies will start using that as a screening tool to see what the likelihood of transformational change of their projects would be. Um, workshops in South America, happy to do this. We've done this with a few agencies and we're willing to do it on evaluation methods. Um, Austria, how will this be implemented? Um, definitely in partnership with agencies and as part of our own regular thematic evaluations. Um, and Stefan, um, yes, we need all the good wishes. OPS is a very comprehensive evaluation. It's not easy. And at this point, since there are a lot of new council members who don't know the IEO team, I'd like the IEO team to kindly stand up. Um, and uh, this is the team that does all the bright work behind the evaluations. Thank you. And, and just a final point uh, to uh, yoshitomo san that uh, we would be very interested in 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 uh, learning from jica and 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 it would be great if you can put us together in 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 exchanging information so thank you very much to you ha and gita for responding to the questions. Um, now uh, we are really running out of time, but let us put to the, I'm putting to the council now the draft decisions related to agenda item nine and agenda item number 11. Any objections to the draft decisions? The draft decisions are so adopted. Thank you very much. Um, Council, we, um, we are going to have, uh, we're going to break for lunch, but we're going to have a, a, a little shift in the agenda. So we are going to take agenda item number seven after lunch, which is the private sector engagement strategy. And then we're going to get back to the exciting topic of the strategic cluster evaluation of the small island developing states. We're waiting with bated breath for that presentation, at least I am. Um, <laughs> So um, we will reconvene at 2.45. 2.45. Sorry, Carola, please. When will we return to the fiduciary policy, please? At the other item carried out I will yesterday. announce it, yeah. So, so that, uh, from my side, uh, that, that you will now getting a copy, you, you will get a copy of those two proposed draft decisions. And uh, the one is policy, a monitoring policy, another one is fiduciary standard. And you have already received the email, but here is a uh, hard copy, so the, please take them up before you go for lunch. And then before your SRC closed the session, I would like to propose that uh, we take some time to hear from you if that, uh, there is a consensus or we need another round of that uh, discussion. So please pick up uh, your email, please pick up your hard copy, and we will meet again on this one before the SRC meeting. I mean, sorry, executive session, executive session meeting um, uh, this afternoon. Um, just uh, uh, 
confirm that uh, actually that uh, William will announce that uh, where we will have lunch? Uh, thank you. So the uh, briefing from uh, UNDP on certain projects is in dining room ABC downstairs, about 50 seats in that one. Then um, we have the briefing on the Mopan and the management response, which is also downstairs. It's room 110, about 20 seats there. And for everybody else, we have, like yesterday, the East Dining Room, 150 seats, and the overflow in the back here. Thank you very much. So see you at 2.45. We need to immediately start at 2.45. We need your collaboration. Thank you. <laughs>